Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to the CASO Think Tank webinar. Today we will be discussing uh, ICT as a sector in Uganda. And uh, my name is Bukenya Paul Michael. I'll be your moderator for today to walk us through the session. Uh, we have a very interesting panel, which we shall be introducing shortly. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to invite Mr. Bernard Wanyama, who is a member of CASO as well, to open up this meeting with a word of prayer. Bernard, you're welcome. Thank you, Paul. Let's pray. Almighty God, we want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you that we've gathered here in your name to deliberate on the ICT sector. We thank you for our country, Uganda. We thank you for all the people who work for its development. And Lord, we pray that as we share these ideas, that they will invoke a new spirit of self-reliance, a new spirit of uh, commitment to progress, and that we shall have action arising from these deliberations. We commit this session to you. We pray all this in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Bernard, for prayer. At Castle, we believe that everything that we can do and achieve wisdom descends from God. So we subscribe to beginning our engagements in prayer. Uh, just to uh, lay out a few things for us to take note of, we will be having poll questions uh, around the discussion and the topic of ICT. You will have a poll question coming your way once every about 30 minutes. And when that question comes, please take time to read through it and respond. We only have so much limited time for these questions. So you respond to the question and give your view um, to it. And the hashtags for this webinar today are hash cup castle webinar and then thrive ICT. So kindly um, can you tag and also as well retweet for those who are joining us through Twitter or following us through Twitter. We are broadcasting on Facebook as well. A webinar attendees, you will have an opportunity to ask your questions. You will notice that there's two chat rooms, but the one that you should focus on is the Q and A chat room. Uh, kindly note, if you have a question or a comment to make, uh, please uh, go for the Q and A chat room, not the common chat section of Zoom. And when you go there, the panelists that we have today will have an opportunity to get to your question or to your comment and respond to it where there is need to respond to it. Some of these questions shall be picked up and shall be discussed later on today during the program. And uh, the program will have an opportunity after the special that we have today has spoken for a public discussion. So we will have a slot where we can engage uh, with uh, all of us who have joined us out there uh, into discussion. But today we are gonna talk about ICT and an opportunity to thrive uh, that has been presented to us by COVID. There has been a number of uh, industrial revolutions from the past and we began with the uh, mechanization that was powered by steam about the 1700s and uh, moved with uh, mass production and the advent of electricity in the 1800s. And then we had the digital boom later in the 1900s. The fourth industrial revolution is now upon us since 50 years ago. And this means that a lot of the agenda is being driven either directly or indirectly by alignments to this fourth industrial revolution. Failure to adapt to the technological and social paradigm shift means irrelevance in whatever sphere one interacts and most certainly extinction. From the onset, the COVID-19 pandemic response measures in Uganda, His Excellency, the President of Uganda, Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, made it clear that Uganda will take significant steps to change course and national priorities towards becoming as self-reliant as possible. This was firmed up shortly after that by the President's eight priority areas for economic emancipation, of which infrastructure was one. And underneath this infrastructure piece, the president placed the ICT sector. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed some glaring gaps in information and communication technologies infrastructures in Uganda. 
and uh, many government and private sectors were not ready to handle the demands of the pandemic that have been imposed on them. Both communication and business transactions were impacted. Now, there's been relatively high cost of access to ICT services and the challenges that have been evident with ICT, with reach of ICT across the country, reliability, uh, data privacy, platform security concerns, and many other issues. Initially, there was a sluggish response, both within the private and public sector. Um, but then there has also been persistent appeals in the past to adapt. Now the pandemic has forced most things to move online. The education sector, for example, has been placed on a near sabbatical, considering that the most obvious way forward is riding off ICT solutions. What becomes apparent is that while the solutions are available, running them has been quite expensive and some sectors were running ahead of the others, for instance, the financial services sector. Emergency response too has been impacted and complicated by the lack of consolidated ICT platforms to utilize during the pandemic. The pandemic provides an opportunity for Ugandans to urgently re-examine and implement the required changes and adjustments as well as investments in order to resolve these challenges, both for now and the future in event of a similar occurrence. But before we move into the discussion, allow me to invite the board chairman of CASO, Dr. James Magara, to make his opening remarks and invite us all, then we shall proceed into the discussion. Dr. Magara, you're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Bukenya, and uh, good morning. Greetings to all. A very special welcome this morning to our special guest, um, the Minister of ICT, who will uh, is already on the platform. It'll be you'll be listening to later. A special welcome to all our panelists. Thank you for accepting to bring your expertise on this platform. Uh, we are borrowing your brains this morning, and we want to maximize the use of them. Uh, thank you, and a special welcome rather to all the other um, participants. I can see the numbers are growing, and uh, we already have people from across the borders. So you're all very welcome to this morning. Uh, Castle uh, is a think tank. It's a bit of a, a unique type of think tank. I've studied think tanks, and uh, this uh, our group brings in some unique. Um, uniqueness to how think tanks normally operate. We've been in official operation for uh, about a year now, but uh, it's built on a training program that has been running for over 11 years, uh, the Institute for National Transformation. And uh, we do have a very wide range of uh, professionals, and that is why we can speak on all these topics, and we still have a long way to go. When the COVID pan uh, pandemic struck, uh, we decided to use this as an opportunity to um, create thinking spaces around different topics. We had a very long workshop online on the 25th of, uh, of April. Well, long in terms of being online, it was about six hours. And uh, we had workshops, breakout sessions, brainstorming sessions. And uh, throughout, out, out of that came um, sector reviews. Um, and then from that, we've done a background paper and then distilled a position paper which is uh, being discussed today. Uh, from today, uh, the ideas that come out of here and uh, will, will be again further crystallized into the final paper, which will be available both for the public and private sector. Uh, we believe we need to apply more critical thinking to the way we do things. We also um, uh, expect that this, I already witnessed that these platforms provide a space for policy, private practice, academics, uh, to interact, and this is critical if uh, those who make decisions and make policies uh, to come up with the right decisions. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, policy bluffs, not only here, all over the world, where decisions are made, and because they're not based on good thinking, uh, we have to do reverse uh, and turn around again. So we do hope that as a think tank, we can contribute uh, uh, to this uh, process that is ongoing. So I don't want to say very much this morning. I just want to say you're most welcome. Thank you for sparing the time. And uh, please 
let's open up our minds. Uh, we want to look at things from outside the box. So let's question things. Uh, we, we are presenting some ideas. Let them be critiqued, let them be challenged. Uh, and uh, out of that, we shall get the best ideas filtering through. Thank you very much. And I wish you a very fruitful discussion this morning. Over to you, Paul. Thank you so much, Dr. James Magara. And uh, on the webinar this morning, we are privileged to host a number of panelists and our special guests as well. And uh, this is in no order of preference. We do have the Honorable Minister of ICT as our special guest today, Honorable Judith Navakova. I'll be introducing each and every one of these um, discussions today in full when their opportunity to speak comes. Uh, you're welcome, Honorable Minister of ICT. And uh, I think the ministry is Ministry of ICT Communications and National Guidance. My apologies on cutting it short. We do have engineer Dr. Francis Frederick Tusubira, but we shall be calling him Tusu going forward in this discussion. He is um, a person that has learned a lot of wisdom in the sector across the continent and globally, former CEO of Ubuntu Alliance and former board chairman, Nita Yu. We do have Mr. Noah Bale Sanvu, the chairman, National Information Security Advisory Group. We do have Dr. Gillian Suzanne Otim, senior lecturer, College of Computing and Information Sciences, Macquarie University. And we do have Mr. Richard Zulu, founding partner and lead of Outbox, as well as chairperson of Startup Uganda. All the guest profiles, like I mentioned earlier, shall be fully introduced to you as they come up to speak. Now, this morning, we're gonna kick off the discussion with a think piece, which is Castle's thought and position on the ICT in Uganda. And to introduce us into this and kick off the discussion today, I welcome the discussant from Castle Think Tank, Mr. Robert Mutiaba, who is the team leader for RBM Enterprise Solutions. Robert Mutiaba currently serves as the team leader of RBM Enterprise Solutions. He's a board member of Child and Family Foundation Uganda. He's a founding board member of Our Trees, Our Future Uganda Limited. Robert is also involved in discipleship ministry, and he is currently the board chairman for Connecting Business and Marketplace to Christ, CBMC in Uganda. He is married to Florence Mutiaba, and together they have been blessed with four children, two girls, Patience Chisache and Faith Chirabo, and two boys, Israel Tindale Mutiaba and Jedediah Isaiah Mokisa. Robert holds a Master's of Science in Computer Science, Bachelor's of Science degree majoring in Mathematics, a postgraduate diploma in Computer Science, all from Macquarie University. He is an alumnus of the Executive Leadership Program from the Institute for National Transformation, Class 12 in Uganda. Welcome, Mr. Robert Mutiaba. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, you're loud and clear, Robert. Excellent. Uh, Honorable Minister uh, and all the dignitaries on this call, uh, I greet you all warmly this morning and welcome you to our webinar presentation. Uh, the topic for discussion this morning has been uh, uh, introduced. And I would like to uh, right away get into the presentation. Uh, okay. Um, the ICT sector in Uganda is uh, composed of the telecommunications, the postal, the information technology and broadcasting subsectors, and is organized along three levels, uh, policy, regulation, re regulatory and service provision level. The Ministry of ICT and National Guidance uh, provides the lead 
for this and uh, does this in collaboration with uh, Mita Uganda, with UCC, and along them is the sector working group that provides a, a coordination role. Uh, the, ministry, the, 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 the sector has been dominated uh, by telecommunications and has been growing steadily for the past uh, 30 years and uh, has been making contribution to the GDP. This contribution, however, is still decimal. It's uh, estimated at about 3.1%. It's largely driven by the private sector. And uh, in the current status, Internet penetration in the country is, is, is estimated to be at uh, a rate of 31%. I don't know what is happening to my slide. Just a second. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, I think. Uh, the current status in the country, the internet penetration is uh, at 31% or 11 to 13 million people. And uh, there has been improvement. Great strides have been made in the internet services, 2G, 3G, 4G, 4G LTE available in the country and there has been discussions of uh, probably moving on to the 5G. Uh, there is a rise in the 4i era. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. There's a rise to the 4i era, the artificial intelligence, machine language, and um, and then the Finitex have also been, uh, been, 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 been changing. Uh, th this country has a huge population of young people, one of the highest growing and the youngest, and every year uh, they are entering the labor, the labor force. Um, ICT provides a unique opportunity for absorbing these young people into the labor force for production across a wide spectrum. Uh, and uh, it, it's an opportunity to, for example, creating digital solutions for various community business challenges, both local and global, as well as generating significant revenue for the country. Uh, our aspiration as a country is a Uganda transformed from a peasant to a modern and prosperous country by the year 2040. Now we have 20 years to go. ICT, uh, business and innovations are some of the key identified opportunities for Uganda. It is as well one of the six priority areas required to achieve overall development goal for the country. Uh, the NDP too envisaged the ICT sector to facilitate sustainable effective and efficient development through harnessing and utilizing ICT in all spheres of life. Further, um, furthermore, the NDP also envisaged that uh, ICT would create the infrastructure and it defined ICT as the facilitating infrastructure for various priority areas. Uh, the focus uh, in these priority areas uh, being on the uh, on, on the increasing the GDP contribution of uh, ICT, uh, extending the national backbone with a focus to deliver the national backbone. Um, and then to also increase employment for the young people and to develop human capital quality human capital, uh, basically uh, the kind of people that we churn out 
out of our institutions and uh, and, and 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 keep uh, a track of good uh, professional development. And let's look at the trends in the sector. Uh, the current trends in the sector. There has been rises, shifts, uh, improvements in various measures that have been instituted and various establishments. The rise in, there has been a rise in cyber crimes, uh, negatively impacting the economy. And this is projected to increase sharply in the future. Uganda lost up to about 122 billion Uganda shillings to this manner of crime according to the cybersecurity report for 2016. Uh, fintechs have been shifting of the, uh, the financial sector to a more digital economy, mobile money, cryptocurrencies, growth in aggregation services, growth in open API options, ETC. Uganda alone uh, has, uh, been, it has been estimated the mobile money transactions uh, are reported to have uh, more than doubled between 2016 and 2020, from 3.4 trillion Uganda shillings to about 7.2 trillion Uganda shillings. Surveillance in recent years, uh, we have seen uh, the use of CCTV surveillance. Surveillance has grown exponentially in the country following rollout of the government CCTV cameras. And this has also brought about a lot of improvement in various uh, sectors, even beyond security. There has been innovation, uh, rapid local growth in ICT, uh, innovations globally, including social media and bigger economy ventures like uh, Airbnb, ride holding, Uber, meal delivery, and others. And our own local companies have participated in this. We have companies like, uh, like Jumia that have uh, become very, very very good fallback positions in, in, the, in the pandemic. In sharp contrast though, the budget allocation to ICT over the years, in spite of this significant effect on a wide range of subsectors, as also projected in the NDPs, has consistently been less than 1% of the total national budget. I felt that that was something that we need to note. What has been the impact of the COVID-19 on the economy and on the sector in, in particular? The ICT sector, though heavily impacted, among others, disruption of the supply chain of technology equipment to the rest of the world, it was relied on to facilitate getting sectors back on track. More than ever, ICT services in education, e-commerce, and communication stepped in to bridge the gap and keep all sectors connected and productive through the pandemic. Uganda re relative lack of readiness for the 4i era, that is the industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution was apparent as many players, both in the public and private sectors, struggled to invoke working continuity plans, leading to a significant slowdown of work activities, further impacting the economy. Uh, COVID-19 unveiled and propelled the need to adapt VUCA world environments in which we work are pretty volatile, they are uncertain, they are complex, and they are ambiguous. One key implication of COVID-19 in this regard is that uh, leaders will not be focusing more on the long term, uh, but operate in a dynamic thinking paradigm with the purpose of creating practical solutions. Um, as we continue to look at how this pandemic has, uh, has affected us, we look at the national fiber backbone. It could not be fully utilized in enabling government. Business online due to lack of readiness uh, of suitable applications and systems to take advantage of the backbone, uh, as well as a slow, adoption of uh, available ICT systems. For example, the legislature is still holding physical, the, 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 the parliament is still holding physical meetings. Uh, there has been partial 
automation of process in the public sector leading to non-existent or limited integration as evidenced by difficulties encountered by governments in, in contact tracing, lack of homegrown five, uh, fit for purpose ICT systems, that's leading to a reliance on foreign ones which are not optimized or designed for our context. There have been gaps in e-commerce and remote collaboration apparent. Questions still remain about learners without access to the internet or without access to some of the resources that we here in the city or we the elite are able to afford our own children. Despite the improvements in internet services, uh, issues of quality and uh, of, of the consumer grade internet have continued to, to dodge us. Uh, we need to invoke, uh, as we invoke work from home, challenges in the justice uh, sector, on deliver of justice, the judiciary did not have an active remote court system because many had previously been apprehensive about it. ICT adoption within the education sector was found to be wanting with many schools and tertiary institutions unable to continue holding classes online once they have been closed. The pandemic has highlighted really, really the importance of affordable and accessible e-learning systems and the uh, affordable internet. Uh, let's look at the challenges that uh, we have observed resulting directly from the pandemic. There has been massive ICT security issues arising from the use of ill-prepared ICT solutions to provide for remote connectivity in order to provide for business continuity. Um, there are still gaps in terms of internet surveillance, service availability, quality and pricing, reducing the ability of many Ugandans to make the most of the internet for personal and business growth. The public sector price is still high. It's reported to be at $237 per megabit per second. Government process automation, interoperability, uh, and integration, uh, various public sector databases and applications has become absolutely critical for the economy and business continuity. The work of the government grows in many cases due to mostly pre-existing manual processes still current in the use. Lack of functional delivery systems. Many of the systems adopted for emergency workarounds were not customized or optimized for Uganda use, such as e-learning and video conferencing. Our reliance on such online solutions for learning or working during pandemic has compelled us to adopt existing foreign solutions. Many of these are not designed for the Ugandan context or African context, if you want. Others are quite expensive. There are also quite a number of quality issues with local grown solutions for lack of, uh, probably for lack of uh, proper certification and assessment framework in place. Inadequate information management capabilities, the pandemic has led to an explosion of information whose sharing is facilitated by the ubiquitous social media network. The bigger problems with the splatter of information in the presence of false information, the so-called fake news, which is not only misleading, but actually uh, dangerous in most of the cases. Social services, employment, redundancy have been occasioned. We have seen it also circulating in the social media. Uh, from the rapid adoption of ICT technology and other effects of the pandemic in the, in, the work, in the workspace. So based on this, we came up with uh, a number of recommendations as CASO uh, that I want to quickly take us through. Uh, NDP3 outlined several key development strategies, among which the following have been identified to be most relevant to the ICT sector. Uh, industrialization in general, uh, important, sorry, import, import substitution, export promotion, uh, development of local contents and institutions, institutionalizing of uh, infrastructure maintenance, uh, promote science, technology, engineering, and innovation, as well as ICT. And secondly, differ from the, the first 
development, the, the sparse through development programs, uh, the NDP3 has taken on a program approach, a programmatic approach, and uh, has listed 18 programs, among which we have identified the two that directly speak to ICT. One is the digital transformation program, which is aimed at increasing ICT penetration and use of ICT services to social and economic development. The expected results of this program additionally aim to reduce the cost of ICT devices and services, increasing the number of direct jobs in the sector and increasing the governance services, government services online. The second program is the Innovation, Technology, Development and Transfer Program, which aims to increase development, adoption, transfer, and commercialization of technologies and innovation through the development of well-coordinated uh, science, well-coordinated science, technology, and innovation ecosystem, SSTI. The expected result is increased gross expenditure and research and development by the government and business enterprises, and as, as well improvement of the country's global innovation index. Now, specifically, the, therefore, uh, we would like to make the following recommendations. Strengthen and further improve improve regulation and oversight. From the perspective of monitoring and evaluation of the execution of ICT recommendations and initiatives in the NDP plans as agreed, a number of ICT items in NDP2 uh, from the reviews that we have done were not fully achieved or executed in, in spite of the brilliant intentions of the planner. Creating a public-private partnership based on oversight committee Best Oversight Committee would add value to this process by generating accountability, considering the fourth industrial revolution world is as, as it is now. This directly impacts on the NDP3 outlined key development strategies as stated above. Uh, our recommendation number two is on internet pricing. As part of NDP3, uh, D digital transformation program initiatives, we actively encourage we encourage actively, the government to actively uh, encourage national ICT disaster preparedness in both public and private sector, and to have this consistently tested at the national level by implementing disaster readiness certifications and by creating incentives for players with high scores to rise, raise the levels of preparedness and readiness. Um, the third recommendation we have is on the disaster readiness. Again, this relates to NDP3, Digital Transformation Initiative. We recommend to aggressively support and pursue telecoms to, on the issue of dropping internet access pricing, to adopt levels for the average Ugandans in order uh, to encourage the increased use of internet in transactions, in business, in education, in communication. The pricing of the service is the biggest limiting factor in adoption of the fourth industrial revolution technologies. And now we have been and we are discussing the 5G. Uh, but the access to this by an average Ugandan uh, is only limited by their capacity to afford the, the, the internet. And uh, the government should consider extending the use of national fiber backbone, therefore to critical growth sectors, such as the education sector. The backbone should also be extended through other high-speed wireless technologies to the entire country. We would have uh, seen much from this during this COVID-19. Um, number four is on automation. Again, relates to digital transformation program initiative. We recommend uh, that the government actively fast tracks the government process automation, interoperability, and integration of various public sector databases uh, and applications. Actively encourage government institutions to 
to really use the platforms to put them to use and to build awareness in the population so that people know that these platforms exist and they are able to hop on them and use them, uh, engage government agencies and prospectors as well as uh, semi-autonomous agencies in order to iron out the concerns and slow adoption of these key government investments. Um, number four is on adoption. Number five is on adoption of open source. Uh, we refer this to the Innovation Technology Development and Transfer Program, and we recommend to aggressively identify, adopt and adapt open source systems and customize them for the use in Uganda in our context uh, through encouraging by Uganda Build Uganda initiatives uh, to leverage and adopt many of these good open source systems in the Ugandan case uh, scenario. We realize that there are actually many, many very, very good open source systems, and some of the developed countries have popped on these uh, open source systems. Uh, number six, we recommend to improve and tighten the ICT security at a national level, actively support the training of an ICT security paradigm right from the tertiary level, so as to churn out more IT security graduates and thereby increase the population of IT security service uh, resources in Uganda, as well aggressively drive the public-private partnership in tandem with Buy Uganda, Build Uganda, to generally raise the IT security maturity level of the country. Ministry of ICT through NITA U uh, and competent by Uganda Build Uganda farms should take the lead on this. The higher the levels of ICT security maturity, the more effective the contribution and direct impact to the NDP3 this will be. Uh, a report from the Security uh, Readiness Center on Uganda indicated that Uganda fell in the formative and startup stage on all the five dimensions that are used to measure the maturity of a country in cybersecurity. So uh, we, lastly, number seven, uh, in effort to achieve the NDP3 uh, innovation, technology development and transfer program, we recommend to fast track the ICT parks in order to increase employment arising from innovation as well as export earnings in the four IR space, leverage the huge young and active Ugandan demographics, demographics as we have already seen, as well as the huge supply of ICT graduates from the universities that are joining the labor work every other day. But, uh, there are some of the biggest facilities in the space, the Sub-Saharan Africa, providing incentives and funding support to innovative Ugandan ICT farms. We also have uh, harvest the innovative nature of Ugandans to provide ICT products and services to the rest of the world. So we, we need to think uh, into these innovations deeply. Uh, in conclusion, we think that if these recommendations uh, that we have made uh, put into place are yeah, carried out, we will have the following benefits. Number one, uh, improved delivery of ICT related aspects within the National Development Plan, resilience of the Ugandan uh, shock arising out of interruptions such as the, what we have been through in the COVID 19 or any other such interruption, increased utilization of internet service, enhanced revenue for the players such as the telecom sector and subsequently the government due to provision of affordable and quality internet service. A more effective and efficient government delivery for every uh, further evening out the service delivery, making it cheaper, uh, relevant, and more affordable and yet functional to Ugandans. We recommend, I mean, we, we see that we'll have a benefit of improved IT security national level security maturity for increased competence in the country as well as uh, resultant redundant, re sorry, uh, resultant reduction in the losses suffered yes. due to security breaches and fraud currently standing at 1.2 billion.
and of course, increased export earnings from Ugandan best innovations, IT skills, and services, uh, as we can also make Uganda a center for ICT security and be able to export our services, uh, not just for ICT security, but any other sector where we can uh, develop our capacity as a country. Uh, thank you very much for yes. listening. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chiaba, for that delivery. And um, as we continue into the discussion, we're about to get into the first discussion for today. But before that, allow me to remind us that uh, the hashtags for this uh, uh, webinar is Castle Webinar and Thrive ICT. Kindly push it to as many of your friends as you can as you retweet the webinar and as you invite more people to the webinar. Now you'll notice that again, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions and make comments in the Q&A section. You will find it somewhere on your Zoom screen. Kindly use the Q&A section rather than the chat section as you ask your questions and make your contribution in form of a comment. And uh, the panelists uh, as well as uh, the castle presenter shall be able to respond to those. But we will be able to pull those up in the last section of this webinar where we will have a public discussion. Then uh, we will be having a poll question, one poll question every 30 minutes. Now this poll question is for you, the attendees of this webinar, uh, to make your view on the question that will be coming up on your screen. So kindly respond to that. The panelists will uh, have to attend to the Q and A's, but the poll question is for you, the attendees of the webinar. And right now, we do have a question, which is, what is the key ICT priority that the government of Uganda should focus on? Is it affordable internet? Is it wider internet coverage? Is it promoting Bubu build by Uganda, build Uganda for ICT firms? or facilitating access to low cost funding and grants for Uganda, Ugandan ICT innovations. What is the key ICT priority that the government of Uganda should focus on? Is it affordable internet? Is it wider internet coverage? Is it promoting Bubu for ICT firms? or facilitating low cost funding for ICT innovations. Kindly make your view known. Um, the poll question is sitting right there in front of you and uh, take your vote as to what you think the key priority for the government of Uganda on ICT should be. In the next uh, 30 seconds, we will be having that poll coming down. So kindly have as many of you vote uh, onto that poll. The poll goes on. Allow me to introduce the next discussant, um, or the first panelist rather, who is a discussant uh, on this paper. And uh, Engineer Dr. Francis Frederick Tusubira, who we shall refer to as Tusu, as he prefers to be called, uh, going forward on this discussion, is the former board chair of the National IT Agency Authority in Uganda, NITAYU, and he currently serves as the District Rotary Foundation Chair. He is internationally recognized in, ICT, in the ICT profession, and he's a transformational leader and an original thinker who is conceived to change. Tusu has key competence in IT policy and regulation, reinforced by continental level and international experience in policy analysis and formulation, capacity building, and research. Outside his profession, Tusu is also dedicated to the advancement of world peace 
and understanding as a global citizen through Rotary International. He has served as a member of the Board of Renew, the Research and Education Network of Uganda, and the Busitema University Council, where he also chaired the Appointments Board. Tusu has served as a member of the Board of UbuntuNet Alliance for Research and Education Networking in Africa. He has also served as the founding CEO of UbuntuNet Alliance. Tenet, the Research and Education Network of South Africa. He has served on the International Educational Eco Access Foundation. He has served on the National Citizenship and Immigration Board of Uganda. He has served on the Uganda Communications Commission and the Uganda Electricity Regulatory Authority. He is the founding director for the Directorate for ICT Support. Makerere University. He is a member of the National Citizenship and Immigration Board, served two terms as a commissioner, also founding commissioner of the Uganda Communications Commission. Tusu holds a PhD from Southampton, UK, and a master's answers from New Brunswick, Canada, and a BSc in engineering first class honors from Makerere University. He is a registered engineer in Uganda and a chartered engineer in the United Kingdom. Before I open up for Tusu, just for us to note that most of us think that affordable internet is the biggest priority for the government to focus on. Thank you very much for the poor. So let us welcome Tusu to speak to us. You're welcome, Tusu. Your uh, microphone is still muted. All right. It's, it's unmuted. Uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you for the background uh, think piece. Uh, since my dentist is part of your team, um, I think one thing which might have been missed out in the paper is the diagnosis, the why uh, these things happen, why Uganda is still so far behind. About 10 years ago, I addressed my school, the famous school, Sogakura Jimuiri, the students and the old boys. And I said, one of the challenges we face in Uganda is, is I think what I call the Okonkwo syndrome. You remember that Okonkwo fought the change in his culture. And similarly, in our country and many countries around the world, there's this continuing fight against technology as it is an enemy. Uh, picture these colleagues. We are talking about ICT. We are talking about an area which needs people to get skilled from the youngest age. And yet we deny them access until they start getting to university. Think about yourself as a parent. If you have got a four-year-old child, or a five-year-old child, do you permit them to access the internet? And I always get amazed when parents say that, no, we don't. And I say, why? That's their world. We didn't grow up with the internet around us, but these children are going to live in this environment. We all bring up children, our colleagues. And at some point when the child is about seven years old, eight years old, you send them alone to the shop to get you something and you panic, but you warn them that you know what? When you get to the road, look left, it look right, look left, look right again, and then cross the road if it is safe. Similarly, instead of stopping our children from getting into their environment at the earliest age, we should be actually customizing them as early as possible. And that codex is my first entry point on this. We cannot change awareness and perception about ICT in Uganda unless we start at the earliest stages of education. And therefore, if you say to me, what is the top priority for ICT and change in Uganda? It's about ensuring that our schools and educational institutions have got full access so that the young generations are fully exposed to the environment they must live in. That is my first point. Uh, because uh, the rest of it is technology. Colleagues have worked in IC transformation at institutional level in Makerere, 
around the country, around the continent and around the world. And we always find that the biggest barrier is awareness that these things are beneficial. I told the vice chancellor of Makera at that time, my friend, Professor Sewuf, that you know what? People say a computer is expensive at $700. And if there's no hesitation about buying a $100,000 vehicle for the vice chancellor or for the minister or for the permanent secretary. And therefore it is not about shortage of resources. Uh, so you say that the budget is just 1%, but picture this. If the ministry itself or any ministry decided that our priorities are ICT, we are not going to buy any vehicles this year, would they have any challenge in terms of connectivity and everything? So that's one thing. If they were aware of the benefits, would you have the policy contradiction where one ministry, which is the Ministry of ICT, does everything to reduce internet prices, and then the Ministry of Finance does everything to get money out of it? So you find that prices are high in Uganda, not because the cost of bringing connectivity to Uganda is high or running out connectivity in Uganda is high, but because the taxes are high. Uh, this is not just speculation. I've done a regional study on this because I belong to Research ICT Africa, which if you like is a continental think tank investigating the challenges of ICT penetration in Africa. And we find that Uganda is a case really because uh, internet should be very cheap in Uganda colleagues. If um, CECOM can land fiber in Kampala and charge a cost less than $1, what does the additional cost? That takes connectivity for government $70 and the private sector to $280, $300 come from. It is a self-imposed cost that is being created. And it's not because cause people feel that we should simply make money out of this sector. It's because nationally we are not aware of the potential benefits if we really permitted the prices to go down. About uh, eight years ago, I think I shall address this. Uh, I gave a keynote at a um, conference in Kampala. And I said that what we do in Uganda is like taxing the grass which the cow feeds on. So imagine a country where I said that if you have got cows for all the grass they eat, you are going to pay a tax. Don't tax the grass, tax the milk. So that is the question of why internet prices in Uganda are high. But the diagnosis still goes back to awareness about the benefits. Then the other one is um, talking about uh, people not understanding the importance of connectivity. Talk about, think about bicycles. When you go to the village, everybody, not everybody nowadays, but most people have bicycles <clears throat> because that's their cheapest means of transport. Why do they have bicycles? Because they find benefit and utility in those bicycles. And my experience is that when people see benefit and utility, then the cost is affordable. I think it's the Baganda who says Chayagala Chikusesa, or what you like, you are willing to pay a high price for something that you consider valuable to whatever it is that you are doing. And therefore, awareness again comes in at all levels. And now we're not talking about the grassroots. So let's start by ensuring that our children from the highest levels understand ICT. You're not going to get many Zulus in this country if you wait for university level to start to change them. If you look around the world, the innovators, the real innovators, most of them don't even go to university. Senior four, senior six equivalent because they already understand this world. And therefore to think that we have got innovators when you're talking about people who first met computers at university is a lie. And I believe Nita, you has taken a step about this. We agreed, I don't know if they actually did it, that they will start cyber clubs at primary school level, at school level so that our children can then come up understanding their environment. These are the innovators that are going to create real impact in Uganda. People like Richard Zulu and others are simply pioneers, a small force which is far from sufficient. It is almost, uh, I'm not uh, knocking government policy, but let's talk about ICT colleagues. In ICT, when you talk about buy Uganda, build Uganda, what do you mean? 
shouldn't we first talk about make Uganda so that people can then buy Uganda? Because what are we making in Uganda in terms of ICT goods and services? It's good to do applications, but picture this. If you want to have 20 million computers in Uganda, each one costing about $300, let's make them cheap. That is a lot of money, which must be spent every year, every five years on maintenance and replacement. Can we afford it? And therefore, I would say that another priority is to ensure that we in Uganda start producing some of these devices. I know some people have started, but it is just too limited. We cannot talk about sustainability in this sector unless and until we start producing not just our applications, but our own goods in the ICT sector. We cannot move a country forward on things that are completely imported. So in that respect, I agree with buy Uganda, build Uganda, but let's first make Uganda so that we can then buy Uganda and then build Uganda. So that becomes Mububu. I'm glad on our Judith Navakova is here. Then the last one, since I'm in my last minute, now goes to the top level. We said that we want to start addressing this from the bottom of the pyramid because we have been working at the top of the pyramid. Real change is going to come when everything happens from the bottom. Our friends, the politicians know this very well. If you want to succeed as a politician, you start with the grassroots. In ICT, we have started with the top and that doesn't work. Then the finance then at the top government level. Things change based on the tone from the top. So one day I challenged my colleagues in the Minister of ICT. I think they have changed now. I said, how can you talk about being a Minister of ICT when people still circulate papers around the ministry? At that time in Italy, when I became board chairman, we said, henceforth we shall be paperless. And from the time I became a board chairman of NITA you for six years, no papers were produced in the boardroom. People came with their laptops, papers were circulated in the soft copy. But if the ministries still meet with the papers before them, how can we expect change in the country? The tone from yes. the top is wrong. And then finally, I talked about contradictory government policies. And this is again at the top. Why don't you have a coordinated approach if we want to really increase ICT services in the country? Because we know the benefits, or we should know the benefits. We yeah. should have policy that reinforces across all sectors. Not the Minister of ICT fighting the Minister of Finance all the time to ensure that costs can remain down. Yes. I think that is my 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tusu. Just uh, to throw in something, you actually allocated more budget to ICT than our current budget this year. It's great to have Honorable Judith Nabakova joining us. Um, when I looked at those budget figures, I think the allocation this year is about 0.36%. But remember that covers communications as well as national guidance, but we will come back to that. Now, uh, Honorable, just to recognize your entry into the room, we shall give you a full introduction when uh, your uh, place to speak comes in. I think that makes a great place for the next discussant. Thank you so much, Tusu. You had some very provoking thoughts there, as well as words of uh, wisdom. Uh, Noah Bale Sanvu. Noah is the chairman of the National Information Security Advisory Group, NISAG. He also serves as the Cybersecurity Committee representative for Uganda on the Cyber Committee, the CERT, for the Northern Corridor Infrastructure Projects. And he is a consulting expert for the National Task Force on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, helping shape national strategy on digital transformation and technology adoption. Noah carries over seven years experience in the telecom sector, having worked with the largest telco in Uganda, MTN, with the ZTE Corporation, and he has over 12 years of experience in the cybersecurity space, serving in various capacities like the managing partner and lead consultant at Computer Forensics Consult Limited, and he is the pioneer digital forensics Sorry, that firm is the pioneer digital forensics firm in East Africa. Noah also consults on digital transformation and emerging technologies. 
as a thought leader in cybersecurity, he has consulted for the Central Bank of Uganda, NITA U, the defense and security sectors, the insurance sector, the justice law and order sector. And he has given numerous talks to professionals and professional bodies, such as the ISACA, ICPAO, CPA, and UBA. He holds a Bachelor of Sciences degree in electrical engineering from Makerere University. Let us welcome Noah to speak to the theme at hand today. Noah, you're welcome. Um, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Tusu. Uh, it's, it's always uh, surreal uh, speaking after the person who lectured you in this very topic. Uh, I, my, my, uh, I go back to the early days in Makere when uh, Dr. Tusu introduced us to uh, you know, the technologies that drive the technologies that we use today. <clears throat> and um, I'm, I'm always, I'm forever grateful. It's also quite a task speaking after him uh, because now all my notes are rendered almost, uh, you know, repetitive, but I'll try and see how we can translate the conversation to uh, what is happening in the world today. Um, I just wanted to start on a tone, on a note that uh, Tusu talked about earlier on, on planning and, uh, and how uh, different uh, government institutions find themselves at loggerheads, when, especially when de dealing with ICT. Uh, one thing that has happened is that with this pandemic that has come in, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing that there is a large, what it has actually done is that it has not introduced new dynamics, it has accelerated what was previously happening. And I'll explain that in, with an example. Uh, we uh, we at, have been on a journey of, of digital transformation for at different levels and at different speeds. Um, and, and, you, and, and what this pandemic has done is that it has accelerated that journey uh, exponentially. I'm reminded of the time in, during Chogam. I remember that time I was consulting for one of the government institutions. And there was a big hype about connecting, uh, and it was actually being led by the Ministry of ICT. There was a big hype of connecting uh, the government uh, ministries using uh, this fiber that we had just uh, put together, uh, you know, with the video conferencing, and it was going to transform the way government works. Uh, you know, there are these video conferencing headsets that were on almost every table of, of, of senior leadership in ministries, and it was supposed to accelerate uh, coordination uh, amongst ministries and, and, and departments and agencies. That was in 2007 and nothing happened. We went back to our meetings and our workshops where we spent a lot of money, uh, you know, and, and, and nothing happens. And in comes uh, 2020, uh, COVID hits, uh, and in one week, uh, there are hundreds and thousands of Zoom licenses that are, that, are, that are shared across the entire government. And by in one week, government is already working in video conferencing. So what took government better part of a decade to, to slowly come, uh, you know, come around, you know, remote working, all this happened within the space of one week. And that speaks to certain realities that we now live in and, and certain, uh, and, and, and not, not just the realities that have been created by the COVID pandemic, but even the world that we go, that we're looking at moving forward. And so digital transformation is, a, is real. It is, not, it is not a nice word to have or a nice paragraph to put it within the NDP three it is actually a, a, a phenomenon that is going to affect as all, all, our, all, all, all our livelihoods. Our socioeconomic fabric is going to be affected by uh, digital transformation. And it's something that we need to be thinking strategically. What I see this is as the, the COVID pandemic has given us an opportunity to reset, an opportunity to rethink what Uganda of 2040 is going to look like. Do we even know? I, I, I was at a group somewhere and I asked them, okay, we keep talking about the vision 2040. How, have we pictured it? Do we know what it looks like? Or do we still think that we are going to be driving gasoline cars uh, in jam uh, in Kampala? Uh, the, the, because sometimes we feel that there's that disconnect between the reality of the future and where we are going. Because uh, the way the government uh, system works is that we look at, okay, what does do the next five years look like? Then we look retrospectively. So the typical process is look at NDP2, what did we fail to achieve, copy and paste it into NDP3 and try to achieve it. That is not the way to, to think through, especially in this time and the new realities. And that's speaking at, at a government level. Now, if you go to private sector, 
because here the, 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 the fundamentals are a bit different, but then it's still about survival. And so what opportunities are created uh, by this uh, rethinking process, which is what is COVID-19, but it's basically a rethinking process, a resetting process to allow us to be more competitive moving forward. Uh, in, in our conversations at, uh, at the National Task Force for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, what we look at is we, 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 we say, okay, the, 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 the primary thing we are looking out for is what are the challenges we need to, to address today? What are tomorrow's challenges? What are the opportunities that we can harness using these technologies? And they're going to fundamentally shift. With every industrial revolution, there is a fundamental shift in wealth. If you look at, if you go back in history from the first industrial to second to third to fourth, the big players in the first industrial revolution are nowhere to be seen. So it's same as the second and the third. Right now, the third is reaching its plateau, its peak. And now we are, we are being ushered into new uh, centers of value, new centers of, of opportunity that can, uh, you know, of challenges and, and opportunities that can be harnessed moving forward. And so that, all that uh, is to say that digital transformation must be core in the government strategy, not just a paragraph, because it's actually a paragraph in the NDP3, but it should be a core fabric that scuts across every sector, the agricultural sector is going to be disrupted by digital transformation. The health sector is already being trans uh, disrupted by digital transformation. So it is not just an ICT thing. My thinking is that it, it cuts across the entire, in the, the entire government and the entire industry. Uh, the, the, an interesting thing, uh, maybe, maybe let, let me make it a bit personal. Uh, you know, because of the lockdown, um, our children have had to, learn to, to go to school uh, online. And so now they have to, uh, you know, you know, log on and get onto their video conferencing calls and, and you know, start working with laptops. Now, um, then the question of, okay, is that affordable? Because, you know, on, on all these teacher forums, you're like, okay, uh, we know that kids need tablets, they need uh, laptops. And now the question is, are their laptops are expensive or look for the cheapest one? And then it's like, we're having a conversation. In, in my head, it's like, we're having should we buy textbooks or exercise books or not? Are they affordable or not? We don't ask that. <laughs> when you're given a bill for textbooks and exercise books, you buy it because it's a tool that is needed for school. Now, guess what? The tool that, that, that is replacing those textbooks and exercise books is a, is a laptop. And that is now the, 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 the means by which they are, are going to learn and even get employed. Uh, we are looking at remote working. Organizations worldwide are now rethinking whether they need people in a, in a physical office space when they can work from home. That's also going to open up interesting opportunities, of course, coming with different challenges. So just to, to shift the conversation around digital transformation, we need to look at what is the experience out there. Dr. Tusu talked about uh, the, 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 the experience at the grassroots level, and he says, once you can have a blend of benefit and utility, it becomes automatically uh, uh, affordable. And my, uh, my example here is, is safe border. I, I use this quite a bit. But you know, if I told you seven, five to seven years ago that uh, a smartphone is going to be held by border border people at a stage and it's going to be a vital tool in their lives, you'd laugh at me and say, no, that's not possible. It's a luxury, why do they need it? But along comes a value proposition that allows a, a border border person to earn a living from a smartphone. So it is charged by morning, by the time he wakes up, he has a charged device and that's how he earns his money, his living. There's utility and there's benefit and they have met and now the, it's a smartphone is automatically or, 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 you know, affordable for the border border, for a, for a typical border border person. Now, again, if we make that value proposition again at the grassroots level, then we'll start seeing a wider demand for some of these digital services. And so we must consider the experiences uh, of, the, of the users at the end point. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I faulted uh, you are at some point when they said that they've now gone e we have an e-tax e uh, system uh, where you know we, you pay for your taxes electronically. But then the first thing they do is they tell you to download an Excel file. And I'm like, what did they even think through the user experience of this? You're supposed to download an Excel file, fill it in, then upload it or download a, a, a bank slip, take it to a bank. So much friction, which means that there was no complete thought through that. I know that system has changed ever since and, it, and they're continuously improving. But one of the key pillars of digital transformation is to think through the experience and how that is going to be translated. Right now, we are seeing the thrive, the, the, the mushrooming of, um, of, 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 of online services. Why? Because the customer experience has changed. I no longer can walk to a supermarket as freely as I used to. 
to, 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 to purchase goods and services and now do that online. So the COVID yeah. pandemic has, has brought about interesting opportunities uh, for us to, to be able to, ha to harness, but then also there's new challenges that we must face. And before I close, I just wanted to mention something about the cybersecurity sector, which is one that is close to my heart. As we move towards digital, that is definitely going to be, the, the value has gone digital now. So even the perpetrators, the criminals are now gone digital. And so the, 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 as a government, one of, the, one of my biggest tasks uh, the, the, that I keep encouraging the government is to create uh, uh, the, uh, an incentive along three main pillars. We, not, we need the right people, and so we must have a lot of awareness, but then anyway, build a career path. We need the right policies and, uh, and, and you know, the laws and regulations, which, of which we have some, and then the right tools. These tools are obvious, those ones we can build them ourselves, as Dr. Tutu, Dr. Tutu has, has alluded to. But I want to speak specifically to the career. We cannot expect there to be a, a thriving cybersecurity industry when we are first understaffed as a, as a nation and there is no clear built out career path. When you ask a young person when they, what they want to do to grow up, they want to be a pilot, a doctor, or a lawyer, no one says cybersecurity expert because it's, there is no clear career path. So one of the challenges we need to do is to create that career path that will cause the pull factor to bring more people into the industry and protect our nation yeah. better. I know, Paul, you're, you're warning me that my time is up. Uh, but yes, I, I wind up with that. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Noah. And uh, just a, a question that I would like for you to think about in, in your discussion, you clearly make a case for imaginal thinking um, in terms of uh, aligning to what 2040 might be and being relevant. And you've given us a couple of examples. How do we move into that imaginal thinking for the four IR space? for the digital transformation in Uganda. It's something that we will come back to later, but it's the question that I'd like you to speak to later. Thank you so much. We are at the place in time for our second poll question. And like I mentioned, the poll questions come up round about once every 30 minutes. And uh, we will need your view and your opinion on uh, the poll question when it pops up. Um, and the panelists uh, will not respond to that question but it is for us who are attending the webinar to uh, give your view and your opinion on that question. I will ask the um, team that is in the background supporting this webinar to put up the next poll question. And uh, as we wait for that, hashtags is Castle webinar and Thrive ICT. And also if you have a question, or a view or an opinion, kindly utilize the Q&A section and uh, your view will be responded to. The second poll question reads, on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being not committed and 10 being extremely committed, how is the government of Uganda committed or how committed is the government of Uganda to ICT advancement. How committed is the government of Uganda to ICT advancement on a scale of zero to 10 with zero being not committed and 10 being extremely committed? There is a scale of zero to three, four to six, seven to eight, and nine to 10. How committed is the government of Uganda to ICT advancement. We are interested in hearing you on that. And as we continue with the polling, allow me to introduce this cousin number three today. And uh, this particular discussant had a huge contribution to my own IT career. I am 20 years into the IT space and I'm into consulting as well. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Julian Suzanne Otim, who is a senior lecturer in computer networks at Macquarie University. Julian has published widely with over 30 research articles and has supervised over 20 graduate students. Julian serves on several boards, including that of Research and Education Network, Renew, and the Ubuntu Net Alliance. She leads the NETS research group, which undertakes research in network systems and system security. 
their flagship research project was the Wimea ICT, in which we have developed low cost automatic weather solutions, weather cast modeling, and software development for weather services. Julian's current research interests are ICT for development, Internet of Things for developing regions, communications, network protocol design, telecommunication policies analysis, quality of service, quality of experience and system security. She also leads the excellent ladies ministry and her ministry is that each woman courageously presses on to their best, best self. Julianne holds a PhD in communications networks from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and after studying internet high-speed data transport protocols. Prior to that, Julianne completed Masters of Science in Computer Science and Bachelors of Science in Computer Science and Mathematics from Makerere University. Our poll is ending now as we introduce Dr. Julianne uh, Suzanne Otim to speak to the discussion. Welcome, Julian. Julian, do we still have you on board? Kindly unmute and uh, activate your video. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, good morning once again, colleagues and friends. Uh, it's also a pleasure for me to participate in this think tank and uh, especially to listen in to the, 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 the conversation, the, the thoughts uh, of people, including my mentor, Tusu. Um, I also thank the, the presenter of the Think Piece. I think it was uh, uh, quite interesting and in setting the stage for the discussion. So um, when I saw the topic of discussion this morning, uh, what I remembered a, a joke that went around in social media in around April, uh, at the peak of the, I believe the peak of the, of the lockdown, uh, that uh, what transition, it was a question, sort of like a multiple answered question, what transition the ICT strategy of your organization and answer A was the CEO, answer B was the CTO, answer C was the CIO, and answer D was COVID-19 pandemic. And I mean, it was a joke because at that time, uh, it was so obvious that everybody was jumping onto the ICT train, all the organizations and, 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 and companies that previously thought it was, you know, a luxury were really getting on and, and, and it was because of the pandemic really. So without uh, much, uh, emphasis so without explaining too much it's so obvious that the pandemic has actually really really accelerated um, the ICT space uh, even in Uganda and uh, while thinking about this as I, I thought about the things that many of the people around me agree that that they, they, they are using more ICT now because of the pandemic uh, and the previous panelists and presenters have also talked about it in education where we actually yeah, to a great extent, we can say that much of education is not happening, but where it's happening in a few of the institutions, uh, the, the learning has been affected, the way learners interact, um, just like I think it's Noah who just said, the new tool is the computer instead of the textbooks, instead of, of, of many of the other things, uh, of, of exercise books. Uh, even the way teachers interact with their students, the way uh, we lecturers interact with our students, uh, to a great extent has changed. It's, I mean, setting up a Zoom call with your students is, is not a, a, a thing just to think about, but I would just to plan for it is something that is already, already happening. Uh, in business, for majority of, of people, we are doing a Zoom call right now. Ideally, it would be a workshop, a very expensive workshop uh, somewhere in a hotel, but many meetings are happening online. Uh, Banking, our banking transactions are happening online. I mean, at the time when we couldn't move, uh, uh, like period of three weeks when we couldn't move in private cars, uh, everybody that had forgotten their e-banking uh, credentials uh, was, I mean, personally, I, I've done e-banking for quite a while, but it's not something I was doing regularly. So I would easily lose my logins and things like that. But I reactivated during that period. Uh, 
the online shopping services, the Jumia and Alive the Safe Board have been around for a while, but it was so optional. But again, in that period, uh, much more of those services were used. And, 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 and even in, in spaces like how we worship now that the churches and other worship places are locked up. Uh, I know that a lot of churches are having fellowships online, are providing online platforms for people to donate or support the work of, of you know, that is done in the worship places of worship. So obviously a lot has changed because of the pandemic for the better, I believe Thrive ICT is, is really uh, a right hashtag to use for such a time as this. So I, in terms of um, aligning myself to the recommendations given in the think piece, um, I thought of, um, of three, three areas. Uh, one of them is how do we really benefit, uh, how do we maximize the benefits that, that have been accrued by the ICT sector due to the pandemic? And um, uh, one of them, uh, I think that think this talked so much about local content. And uh, I completely agree with, with that uh, framework or platform for, for promoting local content, particularly for development. I believe that needs to be looked at differently from, from any other local content, particularly the one that is profit driven. So it's very, there's a challenge. Uh, a particular, I'll give an example that I and my colleagues in Makere face. When we come up with some of these innovations, um, and, and they are contributing to this local content and particularly that has uh, implications for development. Uh, the challenge is like getting access to some of the licensed services. Um, and these are licensed by the regulators, NITAU or, or UCC. Uh, for example, getting access to a USSD code, the license for that is $10,000 per year. So if someone, a researcher has come up with this innovation uh, and they require to pay $10,000, that is a huge barrier. So in this uh, framework of uh, a framework that promotes local content, would there be, I mean, as a policy uh, initiatives, uh, a way of waiving some of these licenses for a period of time to test out some of these services? Because most of the time these services are not actually um, making money per se, but maybe it's a service for farmers, maybe it's a service for fishermen, maybe it's a service, you know, for, or maybe even, even a service for students, but uh, it's, it, many times it doesn't really take off to fly because of such barriers. So that is one of the areas um, that I would think of. And then uh, still uh, under this is the innovations, talked about innovations that have been, you know, have picked up a bit during this pandemic. Um, can we have a way of standardizing some of these things? For example, when I do online shopping and I'm buying groceries and foodstuffs and things like that, if you say I'm buying uh, avocado or sweet potatoes, uh, is there something that can standardize what I am buying such that you know I, I am not I get what I know what I'm going to get and I get what I believe I've, I've told I've, I was told I was going to get. Uh, the other the second area that I thought about and. A poll went out on this is about okay ICT in education. So ICT in education uh, and, and 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 this has two sides to it: technology and policy. The poll went out on technology to this, and obviously access access uh, is a very important thing. How do Ugandans? How do we increase the access of Ugandans to to the technology? And um, Tusu gave very elaborate uh, points on this. And in the space of, uh, of education, I would say that, um, I'll just to add on, just to supplement a little bit on what he said, can we have packages that are tailored, um, more affordable packages that are tailored to education, for example, can we have some of these education sites zero rated? Or can there be within the framework of packages, um, uh, is this concept of the research and education networks, which are really nonprofit which I, Renu, for example, at the moment, uh, provides uh, connectivity at uh, $40, $40 per month per MB, uh, compared to $70, um, the cheapest by some of the institutions. So, uh, and this is mostly because of, you know, bundling uh, just for prior cost recovery. So in the same way, the telcos, the mobile network operators can, can they in negotiation with some organizations like this come up with mobile 
packages that would promote education that are more affordable, um, bulk purchase for the learners and things like that. I believe that would go a long way in increasing access uh, for education. And then on the policy side, both at the national level, but also in the institutions, increasing our readiness uh, for you know, online education. Uh, I guess some of us might be aware that UC was ready to give exams um, at the beginning of the pandemic, but uh, I think there was some, um, this was stopped at the ministry level, but uh, even for the rest of the institutions, they may, some don't have policies, some have policies, but definitely there is a policy issue there to, to increase their ability to, to do online education uh, so that we can be more resilient uh, as a benefit uh, to, to us as a nation. And my final point is on safety and thanks to Noah's thoughts um, uh, in that space, but safety is very important, online safety. Uh, and we can think about this in terms of our children to so tickled us a lot when we say our five year olds, do we give them access to ICTs? Uh, some of the more daring, more daring parents do, some, some, some don't, but even for those that do, I think for, whether for those that do or those that don't, those that don't need more assurance, how, what online safety measures are there, uh, just like you tell a child, because you have walked the road before, you tell them, look this way, look this way, but some parents are not that exposed and they don't know how to guide. So, uh, initiatives around this of promoting online safety for children, for students are very important in that space. And, and then, um, yes, in the think piece, you mentioned about the transactions, the online transactions that happened two years ago, uh, and they had doubled by much of this year, which, you know, 72 million shillings. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah, I'm, I'm concluding, Paul. At the same time, uh, it's, it's also the crime, and, and again, Noah mentioned this, online crime uh, also targeting these transactions. Uh, do we have, uh, can we have reassurance that even as we are doing more online transactions, our money is safe uh, and, and things like that. I think this will be very important in terms of, of, of promoting more of uh, online transactions. So yeah, those are my uh, three points and um, Mostly, I believe this would go a long way in making Uganda, the Ugandan economy more resilient um, and in promoting ICT services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Julian, Susanna, Tim. Uh, indeed, you have made a very strong case for the fact that everything, actually, the world is now online. It's no longer something in our past reality of our day to day. So it's, it's important for us to clean up house and make it work. Um, oh, you'll allow me to make a bit of an exception from our program today. I am made aware that TUSU has another engagement and I, I did not want us to lose uh, the words of wisdom from TUSU. So I will uh, put a couple of questions that have come up both on the Q&A as well as my own. So obviously I begin with uh, my own that came up as you were discussing. Tusu, you brought in a very interesting, I'll call it a concept because I had uh, Noah as well, um, uh, piggybacking on it, uh, where you gave the example of bicycles and you mentioned the whole concept of benefit and utility. And it's um, an interesting imagery that you've given us. It's, it's something that I cannot shake off my, my back for. Now, my question to you is how do you do a benefit and utility case that um, the Ministry of ICT and the government of Uganda can pick up? Uh, for instance, for somebody in Wenge or in Wabusana, or um, it could be any place um, on the extreme um, districts of Uganda, because it's a new normal. So how, how do we actually make a benefit utility case for somebody sitting in that place. Tusu, if you could speak to that, then I have about two other questions from the Q&A for you. Okay, thanks a lot, um, Paul. I'll try to be very brief. Benefit and utility case to Uganda government. I think 
let, let me first of all say that I, I don't believe in this business of the new normal. I don't call it a new normal. Things always change. So the normal is always moving and shifting. Uh, therefore, I don't use the phrase the new normal. We should be ready for change at all times. And I think Noah and Julian underscored that very, very well. Then benefit. Let me take the case of uh, the NITAIO board. And, and I hope my colleagues from NITAIO, some of them could be listening. There was a bit of resistance when we said from the word go that, you know what, guys, we are going to go paperless. Then all of a sudden, after a month or two or three, people started appreciating the benefits. And therefore, if you want to create a utility case at the top level, somebody has to have the courage to make it compulsory for people to see benefit. Because uh, at the top level, people are kind of, um, I, 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 I'm looking for the right word to use because I don't want to offend the honorable minister who is here. But yes, at the top level, somebody must be able to wield the whip and say, you know what, guys, in my ministry, there'll be no more papers. Everything must be done online. And of course, people complain, but when they start complaining, they also start seeing the benefits. COVID is a similar whip. The country has been whipped by COVID-19. All of a sudden, people appreciate that, wait a minute, we can meet online. And these tools are not new. They've been around for the last 20 years, starting with Skype. And therefore, at the top level, I would say forcing function to demand compliance because that is easy to do. At the bottom of the pyramid, honestly, there's nothing other than utility. If content can be generated, you know, I talked about the border border riders. Once somebody sees benefit in something, they can afford it regardless of cost. I talked to a group yesterday and I said that, for example, to the man who enjoys his mar malwa every evening and socializing, they, they find that a benefit. Never mind that is negative and they will not buy food for the family because they think the benefit is in their malwa. And that's why they spend their money. So our money follows benefit. At the bottom of the pyramid, let us utilize uh, this innovator, Zulu and your colleagues. So let's have some applications which some people can actually benefit from. At the relevant, somebody says that, yes, this is actually impacting on my day-to-day -day income. At the minister's level and at government level, that is simply a directive from the president will get it done within two months. Does that answer the question? Oh. Yes, it speaks uh, uh, to the question I asked. Um, the other question, Emmanuel Osanga asked a question here, and he says, I look after the data uh, in brackets information strategy for Standard Bank Group in Africa region. What can we do to encourage homegrown ICT solutions as both private sector and government? Are there frameworks in place to support such? I know we have the Honorable Minister who could also reinforce that, but you have been board chair of NITA that uh, uh, does quite a lot of this or should be doing quite a lot of this on behalf of government. So if you could as well speak to that uh, too soon. Okay, I'll try to be again brief about that. I think we sometimes expect too much from government, uh, frankly. Even the private sector expects too much from government. I think what we should demand from government are removal of some of these uh, weird taxes on uh, airtime and data and excise duty and so on, so that uh, the inputs are cheap. And that we have got a responsibility. The other part of it goes to uh, uh, my colleague Julian. People who are working with the students in the universities. Let us refocus. Let us refocus and throw out many of the useless courses. I mean, we're training people, and we all know this. We're training people who are going to leave university without any skills that anybody wants. And we invest money in that. That's a lot of money. Supposing we refocus that money and we say that instead of simply trying to have more and more people with degrees, why don't you have more and more people with some real skills? For example, software development. If instead of sponsoring so many students in universities, uh, government said that we are going to sponsor people to simply focus on software development and shall take people from senior four, senior six, whatever. If you're interested, come and learn. Because that's the human resource that will then go out. 
and even fill the human resource gaps for people uh, like Standard Bank. Because um, I'll give you a very simple story. When I was sitting on the board of uh, uh, the, the Tenet, which is the Research and Education Network of South Africa, one of the most advanced, if not the most advanced in the continent, the highest paid person was a young man called Andrew Alston, who never went through any form of education, but he was their ICT expert. He got more money than the CEO. Andrew is now with Liquid as one of the senior people. And the focus there was on competence and skills, but so long as we focus on degrees in Uganda, as opposed to competence and skills, this situation is going to continue. So in summary, let us refocus the funding to skills development and take it away from getting a degree and let's reshape the job market so that we don't start with a, with a degree in this because most degrees are totally useless and let's say with the skills in this so that we can test them and then shall be getting the right human resource, the right manpower who can deal with the challenges that we face. Um, and and uh, to see you, you, you actually speak to the skills, which was really the next question I was about to ask. Earlier on, you mentioned that uh, you subscribe to the view that children should be helped to cross the road, or they should be told how to cross the road in this uh, ICT highway. And um, how can you speak a bit more to addressing the skills gaps required for that future readiness? Um, and even as you do that, can you highlight a couple of recommendations maybe you have made in the past on how our curricula from way down at that point to maybe tertiary could be improved to speak to that specific uh, bit of advice? Uh, so your microphone is muted. If you could unmute it. And I'm supposed to be ICT compliant. I beg your pardon, colleagues. Yes, five grandchildren, we have five grandchildren plus, eh? and they visit and they can surf, they can look for things online. One of them is five, their classes are continuing, they're in Zoom meetings every morning, reflections and prayers. And many of you guys on this suffer, I'm not this. So these children are already online and we need to start educating them about the challenges of the internet at that stage. You know, when we were young, we'd be told, you know what, when you are crossing the road, this is what you do. If you're walking along the road, walk like this. When you go to town, avoid some of those areas. Remember the, the red light districts. So we could go there, but because we had been equipped with values and understanding, that is our defense in a changing environment. And we forget this too often. So as parents, we need to hold the, children, the hands of our children and take them through this. This is no different from sex education. And I, I keep on telling fathers that if you have got daughters, you as a man should be the first person to talk to your daughters when they're still in primary school about sex, uh, why, uh, when, and the risks that they run. And they listen to you and they learn and they develop well. The same thing applies to the internet. Let them understand the challenges of the net from a young age. Keeping them out is denying them their future because that is where they are going to find their opportunities and therefore we should never block them out. I don't know if I missed a part of the question. Oh yes, about the curriculum. The curriculum, we sometimes put too much emphasis on the curriculum and we put no emphasis on the teachers. Uh, teachers, especially in the Nordic countries, they did a change, I forget how long ago, where they required teachers be highly qualified in their first degree, I think it was the minimum honors. And then they also gave them very high pay before they even touched the curriculum. And then the output and learning outcomes improved. That's number one. Now, because we have not worked on the teachers, the minister has tried to produce a new curricula which focus on developing cognitive skills instead of remembering uh, where most of us grew up. So the challenge you have is that even if we want to educate children in a different way, developing their cognitive skills so that they, they can become creative and become the innovators, 
we have got a barrier in that the delivery medium where the teachers are people who have failed to do anything else in most cases, apart from the, the, the Kampala schools and others, which can pay very highly, those get the good teachers. And therefore are condemning whole generations to a poor education. And we think that by giving them grace, they are doing good. We have seen them at university, and Julian, you know this. They come there and you wonder, did these people really learn anything? And therefore, I would insist simply curriculum, I would say, put focus on the teachers first, and then the curriculum, which we want to have a real change. That is my strong conviction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tusu. Uh, we have to again uh, accommodate um, because we run a bit late on our program. Kindly allow me to introduce uh, our uh, chief guest for today. Honorable Judith Nabakoba is the Minister for Information and Communications Technology, Communications, as well as National Guidance in the Cabinet of the Republic of Uganda. She was appointed into this position in 2019. Honorable Nabakoba is the elected woman district member of parliament, Mitiana, uh, since 2016. She has previously served as deputy director and spokesperson for the Uganda Police Force and program producer for the Uganda Media Women Association and Mama FM. She has also served as a secretary to Exodus Savings and Credit Cooperative Society Limited, the Savings and Credit Cooperative Society of the Uganda Police Personnel and their families. She holds a Master's of Human Rights, Bachelor of Mass Com, both from Macquarie University, a Diploma in Strategic Leadership and Management from CMI UK, as well as a Postgraduate Diploma in Management uh, and Monitoring and Evaluation, both from the Uganda Management Institution. Honorable Minister, you are welcome to speak to the discussion. Okay. Good, good, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yes, hope you are hearing me very well. Yes, we are on the go right ahead. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm Judith Nawakova. I represent the people of Mitiana. I'm the district woman MP, Mitiana. And I think I'm privileged and humbled to be before you because uh, I've listened in a few speakers, but uh, I'm impressed and I've learned a lot. So I want to thank each and every one for your contribution. Uh, and I believe with the brains on this platform, then we are good to go as a ministry of ICT in Uganda. You've been talking about a number of things, but I want to comment about what Uganda has done so far in the ICT sector. You all know very well that uh, we started, some of us, I will not say we started because some of you have been in this game for quite some time. But I remember ICT became very popular when we were going to host Chogam. If you recall, that was 2006 when I was working with Uganda Police Force. That's when His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, Yoweli Kagutam Seven, went to China and brought a new innovation of the Tetra communication system, then the CCTV cameras. And uh, to us in the force by that time, it was a new thing. It was a new thing. And we realized that it was an effective way of communicating, relaying out messages, but also the CCTV cameras in one way or another. We are good in capturing the images. And I think they did a lot as far as supporting the security network of the country was concerned during that time. And since that time, His Excellency started introducing the backbone infrastructure. If you recall, I think that is the time the first phase of the national backbone infrastructure started and some kilometers of fiber were laid, especially in areas of Kampala and Wakiso. And between that time up to date, we have done so far four phases as government and a network of 4,000 kilometers of fiber has been laid. And that fiber, much as it has been laid, but at least now we have some districts that, are, that 
that have that fiber, about 49 districts, but also some MDAs have been connected now online. Previously, we are used to analog, old ways of doing things. But as we speak now, we have about 480 sites of MDAs. Those are the ministries, departments, and agencies connected to the backbone infrastructure. And uh, the people have started appreciating online methods of work, digital methods of work. And uh, our plan as a ministry is to see that actually the whole government system is automated and also trying to make sure that at least people within the system also appreciate the use of ICT, but also digital literacy has to be increased in one way or another because this cannot be turned in only a day or a year, but people need to be trained. People have been used to paper because I heard you talking about paper. We have been used to paper systems, old systems of work, but here we are, we have to migrate and move with the global provisions of making sure that at least now we learn how to use computers, laptops. And what I've seen, the use of ICT also in a way it improves, improves efficiency, service delivery in areas where applications have been developed, you realize that service delivery has improved. I'll talk about the immigration service Previously, people used to, come in to, to to complain about the delays in the services, but seven border points were connected, but also the application for visa and also for work permits was put online. And you realize that the time someone, someone would spend purchasing a work permit or a visa has been reduced in one way or another. We'll talk about like registering a business online. If we can all recall, people used to spend about six months registering a business, but that time now has been reduced to about four to five days. Since if, if somebody can get online, you'll find that you'll be in position to talk to all agencies concerned with registration of a business. And within five days, you'll be re your business will be re already registered in one way or another. We are also looking at e-government, whereby systems in government will be automated, but, only, but not only automating them, systems to be in position to speak to each other, integration of these systems. We are not yet there, but what I can assure you, the will from government is there to see systems speaking to each other, integration taking place, but also more places being connected online. Then we have also a, a program that is being run by this ministry, which is called the Innovation Program. Government gave the ministry some funds to support our young innovators because you have been talking about software development. We realized that most of the software was got from out. It was imported, the software most agencies are using. But His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda last year directed that we should support our own local people to develop software, which software can be used by government, but also private people. And it is in that spirit that government of Uganda put aside 15 billion Ugandan shillings, which funds have been distributed to the young innovators. If you can recall last year alone, government managed to support 60, 60 innovators and uh, they, are, they, they have been given funds to develop applications. And one of the applications that was developed by use of the innovation fund is the AIMS, that is Academic Information Management System, which is now deployed in seven universities it is helping people to apply online, pay fees online, you know, getting everything online. And the system is still developed. We think that it will roll out to all the universities in Uganda. There are systems like eVoucher. There are systems for e-tax payment. And we have seen that e-tax payment now is not only used by URA, 
but there are also local governments that have started now using the e tax payment system i'll talk about ginger and when the system was deployed in ginger their revenue increased by 37 percent namgongo also is connected to the e tax system but you realize that it is faster it is efficient and it minimizes on the person to person contact because somebody just logs on to the system and they, they pay what they are supposed to pay in one way or another. That's what we want to see as government, whereby everything is connected online. And in that spirit, because we are encouraging local innovators, we have also built a hub in Inakawa. For those of you who have been in the sector for some time, there is the innovation hub government has built in Inakawa. We hope it will be commissioned soon by His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda. And that hub is going to be like a factory for systems development, where young people will be identified after making their applications. We have a team that sits on the Innovation Committee, a team, it has experts like you. It sits, it peruses the applicants, after scrutinizing those who are selected, then they can be taken to the hub, supported fully. A hub will have internet, computers, everything that is required for somebody to simply sit, be nurtured, mentored, to enable them develop systems that will be used by government, but also private people. The hub will be in position to support about 300 people. 300 people at a go. But we have also a system of supporting all working with other regional hubs in the different universities, because not everyone can come to Kampala, but we want to create inclusiveness and equity. Other people also to be in position from where they are, maybe Soroti or Mbarara, go to a university. They are also helped by the ministry and uh, the different lecturers or professors in the departments of science, ICT will be in position to mentor those youths from those respective universities. And they also be in position now to develop software applications. We believe that will be a way of creating jobs for the youths, but also creating systems that can be used internally in this country. We also have the Uganda Information Communication Technology Institute at Nakawa. It is also a training ground for the young people, especially those doing diplomas and certificates. It is doing a great work. And once our products are out, you realize that they are good products because the people who train them, they are experienced people and they give them enough time to make sure that the product which is going out in the public it's a product that is required to meet the challenges we are facing right now. Remember this COVID, uh, at least to us as a ministry, it is an opportunity because previously, of course, we've been talking about ICT. The government has put in a lot of money, but we have been moving at a moderate speed. But now with this COVID, where we need to operate remotely in homes, where meetings have to be conducted online, it means that we have no choice but to embrace this system to make sure that everyone learns how to use these gadgets, but also to make meaningful impact onto the population. And that's why when I came in, I said, yes, I may not be an expert, but I, what I need is a system that can create an impact onto the common person in Mitiana. I don't want only the big people to talk about ICT and be proud of ICT. But I want even somebody from Mitiana, someone from Masaka, from Gulu, to be in position to appreciate why they need to use ICT and how ICT can help them to have, uh, to have services faster, but also to enable them to do their work. And now we are going to strategize to make sure that we increase on the level of awareness to sensitize communities, because we want, a, we want to look at a scenario where farmers can sit at, at a sub-county in a rural district and be in position to, to sit on a computer or on their phones 
and get advisory services from an expert who is seated in Kampala. Somebody simply takes a picture, shows how the crop is affected, and they will be in position to get an advice and quickly address what is transpiring. We want to see our farmers, the market women, embracing ICT, whereby somebody can be in position to sell their goods while seated at a store, but talking to somebody who is at home. The transport industry, it is soon embracing. And, you, and uh, as a ministry, we are now trying to help the transport, that is the border border, the tax drivers, to, to, to develop for them an application that can help them to connect to their customers, but also to know where somebody is operating from, which stage, how can they talk to each other, how can they be coordinated, helped by government to, to get support. Because we believe that if we build a, a team which is organized, then they will be in position to also get support from government, which support will help them to improve their ways of living. So uh, I believe those are, hey, somebody talked about internet cost. If you recall 10 years ago, internet cost was almost at 1,200 megabits per second. But as, as we speak now, internet, because of the government's intervention, internet has reduced to $70 a megabit per second, but we hope, we want to decrease it further because we want to see more people getting connected on internet. And we believe that in this financial year, probably it can drop up to 50% because what we want to see internet, which is being used, which is being embraced by both our young unemployed youths the rural people have talked about, but also the people in Kampala. And that intervention can only be can only be achieved if government puts in money to extend the connections, but also to have more people getting connected on the internet. And that's when we are also going to increase on, on, on the Wi-Fi sites that are created. Currently, we have about 280 Wi-Fi sites Created, but these sites are concentrated in Kampala and Wakiso. We want to see a scenario where other sites are created in major town councils and municipalities to enable the youths to and, uh, and rural women to get information relating to development and improving their livelihoods, but also making them connect to other people from elsewhere. And uh, we believe that will re reduce the space of communication, but also put the people together to share ideas, innovations, and ways of improving their livelihoods. We believe that by your support and also government support, because uh, uh, I know the government of Uganda is committed to see us going forward, but also to invest in the ICT sector. And we also want to see everyone em embracing ICT. We have seen a number of schools and blessing the use of ICT to enable continuity of learning for their learners. But that alone needs to be supplemented if everyone can have access to the computers and also to the laptops. You may find that those who have the privilege to learn online are few compared to the majority of the learners who are up country. But as government, we are also committed to see, to see to it that each and everyone has an opportunity to ICT. And we believe that we'll get there because the will is there to see the ICT sector grow in one way or another. I want to thank you once again for this opportunity and I'll keep contacting you for guidance, for ideas on how to take this sector forward because I believe ICT is the way to go. We are now the driver of the economy. We are the driver of everything, but we need people like you to make us steer what we are supposed to steer forward steadily, but also firmly. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Honorable Judith Nabakova. I am wondering, Honorable, if you have time for maybe three questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Honorable. 
The first question really is at the place where you made a very important statement in your closing remarks that ICT is underpinning everything. And indeed, we are in the fourth industrial revolution, as many uh, panelists have said. And I think there's a great opportunity for us uh, where ICT can actually become one of the government's key earners on our current account. Why, why am I saying that? Makere University College of Computing alone has a capacity of over 10,000 students. So that means that on average, every maybe two to three years, there's about 10,000 coming from just Makere University alone. But we have UCU, we have Nkosi, we have many, many other ICT universities in Uganda. So we have a huge human resource. There has been as well innovation uh, centers. And indeed today we have uh, Richard Zulu that represents Artbox. The brains to innovate in Uganda as well as the age group to innovate is, is huge. But we had a concern around the budget um, allocated towards your ministry. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 0.36% of the total national budget. When you look at um, other countries that have prioritized ICT in the way in which we clearly need to, as a nation, those budget figures that are allocated on just core IT is between one to 3% of the total. And that's globally across, when you look at countries across that take IT as a key priority. Indeed, countries that are leading in earning from ICT um, what are your plans as a ministry in terms of lobbying for a bigger budget? Because like you have rightly said, we need to deal the infrastructure. We need to build more ICT parks. We need to fund a lot of these innovations. What are the plans of the ministry toward that honorable? Okay, thank you very much for, for that question. Of course, uh, looking at the budget, you may find that we are among the two least funded ministries in the country. And uh, as a minister, I have always communicated to my boss, but also to the Ministry of Finance about the concerns and the need for the government to invest in the ICT sector. You all know very well that much as we are getting little funding from government, government had made deliberate efforts of getting external funding. We got some funding that helped us to do some favors of the backbone infrastructure from the World Bank. And I think that's why we managed to move where we are, much as we have a long way to go. And I believe still using the same spirit, we are going to lobby government. We are going to put our case to the government, especially His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda. I know he's committed to supporting, despite the priorities, because there are a number of priorities, as you all know. But I think this time round, we have to look at ICT as a necessity, as an infrastructure utility, just like as we invest in water, we invest in electricity, even ICT has to be invested in if, if we are to move forward. We are going to lobby, and we started long time ago, we believe we will lobby and be in position to get some funding. We will convince even our cabinet colleagues. We are going to convince parliament. The good thing, parliament and cabinet have all embraced the use of ICT because if you, you know what is taking place, most of us are now connected to Zoom, Skype, people need internet in their homes, they, they a lot of things to do while at home, a lot of work to do while at home. It means that the only way we need to do to help ourselves as government, but also the Ugandans who are out there is to invest massively 
for the planned phases to continue so that the entire country is connected. So if you have ideas also on how we can be assisted to get funding for us as a ministry, we are open-minded and we are ready to receive those ideas so that we can move together as a team to deliver our mandate as a ministry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable. In your earlier submission, you mentioned about the farmer down in Mitiana being able to take a photo and mm. uh, get um, an extension worker help them. In uh, 2013, in part of my career, I got involved with a project that the Grameen Foundation had actually funded in Uganda. They actually developed a mobile app that does all that and more. And it was being used in uh, some pharma groups in Eastern Uganda and some pharma groups in Central Uganda. And it really did quite a bit of work. Now, my, my purpose in highlighting this is that actually many of the things that government would like to do have been done by the brilliant Ugandan developers and IT professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, the ministry's plans on the public-private partnership because this now brings us to that place where even in your planning and you're getting ready for lobbying for more funding and more budget and a lot of the discussants as well today have intimated on the critical need for public-private partnership as well as the monitoring of projects for example that are being done we, we, we had it um, uh, a few statistics from NDP to some of the critical thinking that had been done into that. And you know where we still have gaps on even covering that. What are the ministry's plans on the public private partnership, uh, both from a planning uh, as well as from an advisory as well as funding perspective? Are there any plans for that? And if so, kindly share with us what those plans are. Oh, of course, uh, uh, as a ministry, we have been working with private partners. I have to confirm that. And uh, some of the innovations that have been taken on by government are a creation of the private sector. And if you can also recall, even during this COVID, the private sector has helped us a lot as a ministry to deliver our mandate, but also to help Ministry of Health do what they are supposed to do. A number of applications have been developed. For example, I'll talk about the one which is now recent, the journey management information system for the truck drivers, where truck drivers are expected to be monitored. They are different routes uh, and that application was developed by a private person who came, shared that good innovation with us. And as we speak now, they are working with our ministry and Ministry of Health, Transport and Trade to make sure that we give him all the necessary support. And we also said that as government, we would be more than ready to host that application at our data center by Nita U. And there are a number of people, there are those who have done things in farming. You talked about farming. They have developed applications in farming and those applications are already employed in the different areas. There are those who have developed applications in helping to reduce infant mortality, especially in the Western Uganda. We worked with them and we supported them where we could. And now the applications are making a meaningful impact in those respective areas where they are. Right now, I would say that as a ministry, our policy and what we believe in is that we cannot work in isolation of the private sector. We have to move with the private sector. We have seen that private sector, at times they are quite faster in as far as making the innovations, but also deploying them. 
and we will learn a lot from the private sector where support is required and we have that support as a ministry, our hands are open to support the private sector. And where you can help us in developing the system, we are, we are more than ready. As long as the system is going to deliver what we want, it's going to simplify our work, and also it's going to add value to what we are supposed to do in the sector. I think I'll try to answer your question. Yes, Honorable Minister, just um, on that one. So if a think tank like CASO or any other that may be on this webinar today would like to have that kind of engagement with you, do you we have- We are more than ready. You are most welcome. We are more than ready. Please just make an appointment. We are ready to interact with you. Great, just a last question that comes in from uh, Dr. Frederick Chino Kanobe. Uh, Yes. Uh, much as the role and value of ICT during disaster management has been openly exposed during this COVID-19 pandemic, the government of Uganda has not placed technology-based small and medium enterprises among the priority services during the current level of lockdown in Uganda. For example, many SMEs in ICT-based services and products such as phones, computers, and computer accessories are not operating. Uh, Dr. Kanobe would like your comment on that. They are not operating? Well, I, I, I don't get that question properly. I think uh, it's deriving from uh, maybe some of the premises. Maybe Dr. Kanobe could type a more a clarification. Um, but yeah, the way the question was phrased. Because, because why I'm saying that the question is not very clear. If you can recall when the lockdown started, I think ICT was mentioned by His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda among the essential services. And even when the lifting of the lockdown started, the ICT sector was allowed to operate Fully, those selling phones, they, they are, we, we have a camp and called Simi, such and such. They, they are operation. They are working and, I, and uh, they, are, they have never stopped working. Even those operating in, 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 in uh, let me say, the, the SMEs you are talking about, they, they are operation. They, 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 they were not stopped from operating. So uh, maybe I, I, I think I did not get him quite well. If he can rephrase it, then I can be in position to answer it properly. But what I know, government has taken ICT as an essential service, regardless of which service somebody is offering, whether small, whether medium, whether big, because we knew that the services of, of ICT were needed more than any other service, especially in this pandemic of COVID. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We will be happy to still have you on, but when you're ready to leave, we will understand that you have other appointments. Just and a I, comment. Sorry, mm -hmm. Minister, go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity given to us as a ministry. I'm humbled, and I said it when I was beginning, I'm humbled, I'm honored, because I've been talking to people who are professionals, who know what they are talking about. And if I haven't addressed your concerns the way you wanted me to, probably next time we'll try to do better, but I'm more than happy. And as a ministry, we are more than ready to interact with you to get more information, more guidance, and also more ways of improving and running the sector. Since it is the new normal, somebody said we shouldn't, we should not call it the new normal, but to us- was too soon. <laughs> yes, but we still refer to it as a new normal. So I want to thank you again. May God bless you richly. Amen. Thank you, Honorable. As a parting shot, one of the, the second poll question we asked, asked how committed is government of Uganda to ICT advancement? 85% of the respondents um, mm -hmm. 
Howard did six and below. So there's definitely a lot of work and we will be happy to hold hands with the government of Uganda to see how best to improve our country and make this space much better. And thank you for the open invitation as well towards that sort of collaboration. Thank well, you, Honorable Minister. Thank you too. And on that note, we, we, are, we are ready for our third poll question. I will request the administration team in the background to throw up that question as we get ready for the next discussant. Uh, what is the biggest obstacle to improving the quality of local ICT products and services? What is the biggest obstacle to improving the quality of local product, ICT products and services? Inadequate skilling, inadequate funding, insufficient policy oversight, or access to cheaper foreign alternative solutions. What is the biggest obstacle to improving the quality of local ICT products and services? Is it inadequate skilling of the ICT personnel? Is it inadequate funding for the startups? Is it insufficient policy oversight and regulation? Is it the access to cheaper for opinion on the statistics are still below the desired? The biggest obstacle to improving the quality of local ICT products and services is it skilling? Is it inadequate funding for startups? Is it insufficient policy oversight or the access to cheaper foreign alternative solutions? 10 more seconds to this before we go to the next discussant and indeed the last discussant before our public discussion. Okay, I uh, believe I, we end the polling at this point uh, with 70% uh, of us responding, inadequate skilling as well as inadequate funding seem to be almost running at par with each other. So but I wouldn't also put policy oversight far behind. The one that seems is significantly lower or that is an outlier on all of that is the cheaper foreign alternative. So most respondents don't seem to see the cheaper foreign alternatives as an obstacle, but rather the skilling, the funding of startups and the areas on policy oversight. Thank you very much. And uh, the next discussant is uh, Mr. Richard Zulu. Richard is the chairperson for Startup Uganda, an association that brings together key players in the Ugandan startup ecosystem. And uh, he is also a team leader at Outbox, an organization that brings together infrastructure, people, knowledge, and capital to support African entrepreneurs through the growth of inclusive communities that foster talent and create value. And for the last 10 years, Richard has been instrumental in starting and growing a developer and startup ecosystem in Uganda. And that ecosystem has partnered with Google, with MTN, with UN to mention but a few. He's previously worked with Macquarie University under the Directorate for ICT support. He's also an East African Acumen Fellow 2014 and an alumnus of the US State Department International Visitors Leadership Program in 2016. He holds a Bachelor's of Science in Information Technology. Welcome, Richard. Speak to the discussion at hand. Thank you very much. Um, good morning to you all, uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, and the attendees uh, on the call. Um, I've listened in very, very closely uh, to the think tank piece and the contributions made by a number 
of our panelists uh, and guests. And uh, I'll, I'll largely bring in the perspective of this aspect of innovation and ICT business. Uh, Paul, can you still hear me? Yes, Richard, you're awesome, clear. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I saw your photo frozen, so I thought I'd gone off. Um, so I'll bring in this perspective um, where we're focusing on innovation and ICT business, largely because uh, that's an area where I operate uh, together with other like-minded organizations. And also in line with COVID-19, I'll largely speak to the aspect of response, uh, resilience and recovery, as we want to look at it in the aspect of entrepreneurship. And to speak to what we've seen largely during this period of COVID-19 in our mandate of creating work opportunities for young people, because this is the elephant in the room. Uh, how do we help these young people uh, respond to the challenges posed to their businesses under COVID-19, recover, but also build resilient businesses? So part of our work at, at Outbox is to skill young people to build talent, not only businesses, but also digital skills. And part of that extends to the aspect of digitally enabled businesses. And one of the things that we've noticed over the last three months is we've seen a growth in interest. And this is also from a survey we run within our smaller businesses, startups and micro businesses, is the interest in how micro and small businesses can actually use digital tools uh, in terms of building the resilience, uh, but also in terms of how they respond to COVID-19. And we had to make a change previously in uh, one of our, in our academy called Outbox EDU that focuses on just skilling software developers. We had to make changes and shift our, a lot of our focus in helping the micro and small businesses actually uh, learn how to use digital tools. So simple things like using Google Maps, simple things like digital marketing, simple things like setting up shops on local platforms like SafeBoard and on global platforms like Facebook was very, very instrumental to a number of these young people in terms of how they saw ICT playing a role. But what we also came to learn during this period was that it was not enough to teach them on just ICT tools. They also needed to know some business skills. As you know, a lot of our micro and small businesses just do things as is. But with COVID-19, they really had to rethink uh, their business models and how they approach that. So we've, we've been doing quite a number of, of, of lessons uh, and skilling and applied skilling in, in one class, we could have close to 100 businesses. We're partnering with the Federation of Small Businesses and other innovation hubs that do not have digital scaling as a core competence to help them scale their startups and businesses in terms of how they can use this. But it's interesting that we've got to appreciate the purpose of being inclusive in terms of how we think about the role of ICT. For instance, a case in point was how we were delivering our skilling aspects. We using, you know, uh, tools like Slack, we use Zoom and everything like that. But we got to appreciate that a number of, of the participants that came in looking for this aspect of, of skilling were not well versed with these tools. And so to start onboarding them and getting them to appreciate these tools, we had to start with where they are. And that including shifting to platforms like WhatsApp, to you using micro learning approaches, because we noticed a number of these learners were accessing our service over a very simple mobile phone. And so we had to rethink the aspect of inclusivity. And for me, that speaks to what Honorable Navakova has said in terms of, yes, technology is there, but we have to think strongly 
about access and how our small businesses uh, can actually utilize these digital tools when it comes to building resilience around their businesses. Now, the other piece is the other businesses that at the core of what they do was ICT, ICT driven, right? They're not laying on ICT to just improve the efficiency, but the ICT driven like fintechs and, and other businesses like that. So they saw a growth in demand, right? They saw a growth in demand and they had to rethink their platforms. So businesses like Rocket Health, which is in telemedicine, Sente, which is into payments, eventually found themselves div divesting into e-commerce and trying to build storefronts uh, that other small businesses could leverage on their platforms, um, but also to enable uh, the efficient uh, building of marketplaces using their platforms. And when we did interact with them in terms of how they were responding and trying to build the resilience of other small businesses, one of the things that still came to mind is what we've all been talking about, which is the technical skilling. And, and, and this is an area where they were looking for software developers that could quickly build platforms. We received lots of calls from different entities that wanted to build digital platforms. But despite the fact that we have a digital academy just focused on, on digital skilling, we found ourselves that it's not enough for this to be done by one organization, but rather a cohesive approach in terms of how we look at ICT skilling. So they struggled with technical talent. They struggled with things around infrastructure. So for purposes of building inclusivity, for instance, we had a business that was into providing farmer inputs and leveraging digital platforms for that. But the high cost of low cost, tech, low feature phone technologies like USSD became a very huge barrier in terms of how they could quickly grow and scale up during this COVID-19 period. And it's nice to see that uh, we need to think about demand aggregation to bring down the cost of this infrastructure. The taxes are there, but I believe if we come together and consolidate some of this infrastructure, we can definitely uh, find ways of negotiating to lower costs. So we're still having discussions with the likes of MTN who want to really figure out how do we come into this space and actually help within the innovation and entrepreneurship sector. The other aspect that came up during this period was around the localization, the context. As you see, a number of our tools are in English, but some of a number of the people and the largest segment are very comfortable with local languages. At one point, we worked with Kampala Capital City Authority to digitize their waste management system, where we built an app that would enable uh, suppliers or service providers to keep track of their orders. And now we are working and very soon you'll see us launching an app that can enable you to order for waste management services at the comfort of your home, okay? And we shall later take that into emergency services. But one of the things from our testing that was clear, uh, we, test, we tested in slum areas, we've tested in very many places, is the importance of localization and local languages. And as we're having this discussion and making recommendations in terms of how ICT and COVID-19 opportunities can spread, we have to also build those linkages between language boards and the people building these tools to enable that to happen. Then lastly, um, that I would want to speak about is what everyone has talked about. And this has been a very huge question that came up within the businesses that we support, where they struggled with what role can we play or how best can we push for digital literacy among the people we serve, right? And, and I like this suggestion from Honorable, uh, from uh, Tusu around starting with the schools, the school clubs and everything like this. Uh, but at the core of it all, for those who don't go to school, what other avenues uh, could we create for them to learn digital skills. People have learned how to bet. They go into a betting shop, 
they see it and actually place their bets. And for me, I think the use cases around which we build these ICT tools, be it education, be it waste management, be it emergency services, be it linkage to work opportunities, create an opportunity for these people to learn. No one came to teach us how to use WhatsApp, right? And so we strongly, strongly have to think about the use cases that we put forward as we're pushing for these ICT uh, tools. In the interest of time to encourage discussion, I'll keep my contribution short um, and then uh, we can take more questions from there. Over to you, Paul. Thank you so much, Richard. And indeed, we have really run short on time, but we will jump straight into the, some of the issues that came in through the uh, Q&A from the general listeners today. Actually, a number of these questions have been asking them combined with the different people that have responded. Martin Patrick Ongola asked a question Technology foresight tools like Delphi, horizon scanning helps a lot in coming up with concrete approach. Without such analysis, the four IR strategy may miss critical interventions. They, um, they, he says that in Uganda, we, we are not extensively using technology foresight tools. Now, Noah, you mentioned quite a bit in terms of um, foresight in your discussion, and I would like you to speak to that because when you spoke to us, you intimated on imaginal thinking. You will notice that I also asked you the question earlier, how do we move into that imaginal thinking for 4 IRA and uh, being relevant in that digital future? So kindly, Noah, speak to that question. Do we still have Noah on site? Oh. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for the question. Um, that is actually a very good point. And uh, which, which uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to speak generally, not particularly only to the case of Uganda, but foresighting and, and, and future thinking is not something that we have embraced fully as a society, especially in Africa. And, and I'll just use a simple statistic. We only have one future institute in the whole continent, which is in South Africa in Cape Town. And what a future institute does is that they look at, uh, as in their business is future, uh, they look at what trends and how they are going into the future and then being able to work backwards. Um, I, just, I finished reading a book recently, uh, which is uh, Lead from the Future by uh, Mark, uh, Mark Johnson and Josh Seskowitz. And they, and they make interesting points here about working from the end, beginning with the end in mind, which is one of the seven uh, uh, habits of highly effective people, beginning with the end in mind. Sounds simple, but then, you know, when, when it comes to practice, we still look forward, you know, work from present looking ahead. But if we stuck, stop and take time uh, habitually, but this, and this applies both to, to, to government and to businesses, if we habitually uh, to, to take time to think of the future and then work backwards. In the book, they talk about an interesting example about uh, Steve Jobs and, 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 and in, in the height of the dot-com bust, this is when major, all the major tech companies were losing a lot of money uh, in 99, 2000. Uh, Steve Jobs takes a team of, 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 of his top uh, um, leaders in the organization. They go on a retreat. And in that retreat, uh, instead of addressing the problem they were facing then uh, of the dot-com bust, he instead asked them to paint a picture of 10 years from now. So in that meeting, they, were, they had a, a, an envisioning. It was a full retreat of a weekend, an envisioning. It's not captured in many popular documents, but it's in his, uh, in his uh, bio, biography, it, he mentions it. And in that meeting in 2000 is when they conceptualized a universal, what they called a universal device, a universal device that will bring together your entire digital life, where you'll have your music, you will have your pictures, you will have your communications on one device. That device ended up being the iPhone but they thought about it 10 years before the iPhone was actually created. And so we see the phenomenal drive, just that one product has driven the smartphone industry into the trajectory we are seeing today. That is the power of future thinking. And until we put our minds into a future space and work backwards, uh, we will always be addressing the problems of today, uh, looking down on the ground and not looking ahead. Uh, governments like uh, Dubai uh, have a, a, an entire ministry dedicated to the future. It sounds funny, but they have the Ministry of the Future. 
but this is what they are doing. Dubai in its strategic plan is 10 years, and, that, and the work of that ministry is to keep Dubai 10 years ahead of any major city in the world. And they're intentionally investing in that reality. So my, my, my challenge to us is to get into the habit and the practice of thinking with the, with the future in mind and working backwards. Yes, uh, there are unpredictabilities like this COVID pandemic, no one could predict it and its implications. But then again, if you had a picture of 2025, if you have a picture of 2030, what this pandemic does is just shed some light in different areas of that picture, rather than causing you to completely uh, you know, disrupt. And that speaks to, 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 to many of the challenges we face now, because we face these challenges because again, in our approach, we look at what didn't work in the last five years, what can we improve then extrapolate that over the next uh, five years, which is not a sustainable thing. So future thinking definitely is a way in which is a practice we need to get into. Now to speak to 4IR and, and, and the use of, of modeling as, as, as has been asked, yes, this, this is something we have taken into consideration as the task force and it's something we are actively doing. And so in our work, uh, not to, 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 to preempt much of the work we're already doing, uh, our output is coming up in the next couple of weeks for public consumption. And so, uh, and, and, and so we, we can have a deeper discussion on that, but definitely we have taken it into consideration, looking at the trajectory of these technologies like AI, like blockchain, like artificially, uh, like um, 5G. I know that these are causing heated uh, conversations, uh, but then again, what, what is the value we can derive as a country? And how do we make sure that we are, not, we are and, and one of the challenges I, I keep raising in, the, in, 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 the, in, the, in that forum is that we need to stop being a four, four IR you know, task force because then five IR comes, then what? Do we create another task force for five IR, then six IR? No. What if we are continually yeah. thinking of the future and imagine technologies view? And so we have been forced by this uh, pandemic, but also conditions of the four IR, be these technologies uh, culminating now, and now we are forced to think ahead. Now, now that we've been forced to think ahead, how can we make that practice? How can we do that and by, by default rather than having conditions force us? Dr. Dr. Tusu mentioned that, the, 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 the carrot and stick. We use the, the carrot for the bottom of the pyramid, use the stick for the top. How do we make sure that in our, in our planning, in cabinet meetings, that one out of every, you know, one, one cabinet meeting every quarter is considered only to think about the future? Think about 24. What is the reality there? I made the I made the pan of you know, are we going to be using gas 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 gaslers? Are we going to be using uh, vehicles that use uh, fuel? Hence now investing everything now when the entire world is moving electric. You know, yeah. in 10 years now, do we are we are we prepared to to produce enough electricity to run the entire economy on electricity? Uh, I recently saw a, a slew of now e, e bikes. My border borders are now going e which makes yes. the cost of running a border border much lower. Are we thinking about that? And so yes. there are so many parallels we can draw in this, um, but then my challenge to us again in, in solving that question is to make future thinking a habit. If it is a habit, yes. then you're continuously present in the future space and then working backwards. Yes, thank you so much, Noah. Um, indeed, in your discussion, you talked about 4IRA. And the next question that was asked by Peter Serukera is something that I would like Dr. Julian Sansa to speak to, and I will reinforce it with a couple of my own observations. Peter Serukera asked, despite a 44% mobile penetration rate, Africa, including Uganda, still has the world's most expensive paid mobile data plans in relation to median incomes. On average, mobile data prices represent a staggering 8.76% of income. Uganda government ICT ministry that has been on the webinar, this should have gone to the minister, but there are certain elements that I would like you, Dr. Julian, to speak to. In relation to that question, I noted a very interesting statistic that Tusu gave when he was speaking. He referred to the undersea cable of SICOM um, providing one megabit per second prices of close to a dollar. I don't know whether that was a mis a misquotation, but he mentioned something to that effect. Then when you came on, uh, Dr. Julian, you talked of Renew uh, providing one megabit per second at $40. And then 
um, when the Honorable Minister spoke, she talked of the one megabit per second pricing being at $70. Mm -hmm. My own experience in my private engagement with internet service providers for the big buyers of internet bandwidth in the country, the pricing of one megabit per second oscillates somewhere between $35 to $70 and above per megabit per second. So there is a huge, huge disparity in the price of internet. We can as well say that 4i Arakan is a dream if you remove the, the, the operative word internet from it. What are your views on what can be done on uh, the cost of internet in Uganda? Dr. Julian. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for sharing those statistics. This is really a pertinent question uh, in terms of uh, yeah, the cost of ICTs in Uganda. And uh, I, I saw this question from Peter. Uh, it would indeed be, have been helpful for the minister to comment on it. Uh, but my quick thoughts are one, um, and, and Tusu already alluded to this, there is a tax issue here. Um, and yeah, it's for connectivity, but also other ICT services like the devices and stuff like that. But Basically, um, the Ministry of ICT together with the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of ICT, including the regulators, UCC and NITAU, um, I think a lot can be ironed out by a roundtable discussion among these people in terms of evaluating uh, the taxes um, that, 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 that are incurred or that are given to these providers and what we lose out uh, by keeping the taxes there and keeping the number of users. Uh, I think it was in the think piece that it was 31%, although I see here 44%, but if many more users uh, got access, um, the price could really be low and the same profits could be earned by the telcos, the operators. So uh, there is a, there may be some value in continued engagement at that level to drive the cost significantly lower. But also, secondly, um, uh, telecom companies uh, themselves are mobile, especially for mobile connectivity, because there is, you know, there's fixed connectivity. And I think these uh, statistics are mostly for the fixed connectivity. But for mobile connectivity, the kind that we get through uh, mobile phones or MiFi's and things like that, um, the, the kind of bundles uh, that are being offered consider uh, like for individual use, like for you working at home as an individual. Uh, there are no bundles for schools, for example. I mean, an innovation and, I, and uh, Kenneth, which is the equivalent of Renu at Kenneth in Kenya, managed to negotiate something like this during the pandemic for all Kenyan institutions. Uh, could telcos think of innovative solutions? I mean, they would be innovative at least as far as delivering on, on, on for some certain users like in the education sector, but ba bundles that, um, that would definitely be much cheaper. The reason Renu is able to offer this kind of uh, connectivity much cheaper than a standard ISP is because it's bundling for all the research and education institutions in the country. So uh, instead of the ind individual institutions going to the telecoms and negotiating, which was the case prior to Renu, instead of Macaria alone or UCC alone or IDI, the Infectious Disease Institute alone, uh, negotiating and buying this in a per se um, retail price, all the institutions would negotiate for a bundle from the telcos and be able to get at a cheaper price because it's a bulk purchase. So could telcos come up with products for schools, for learners, so that, you know, uh, one, one cost that a school pays covers all the mobile users in that institution. I believe, uh, I, I mean, this might be sector per sector, but it's definitely a worthy way of thinking about this. Those are my two quick thoughts about that. Thank you, Dr. Julian. There is another question by Samuel Siminu, but Honorable Minister is away. I will ask the question, but I'll ask uh, Richard Zulu to comment about it from a perspective of somebody who has been playing in the space of service provision. The question Samuel Siminu asked is that the government of Uganda and stakeholders should take note of the negative role 
played by corrupt officials in hindering the uptake of ICT solutions in all sectors. Often, whenever the ICT solutions interfere with their eating in brackets, they do all in their power to make it fail. The required transformation is impossible without addressing this cancer in our systems. And Richard, to you is, how have you been able to navigate this uh, sea and still make an impact in Uganda? Because you're clearly seated on this discussion because you have made an impact. Can you please speak to that? Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, definitely corruption or coercion or bribery or what you'd call it is, is, is still something that, that needs to be addressed in a number of, of government institutions. Um, in our case, as, a, as in a, an innovation entrepreneurship support organization, the way we have been able to position ourselves is through partnerships uh, with government entities, with development agencies, and made the use case of how, it, how important it is to support our young people that are building local solutions. So for instance, uh, through the National ICT Support Program, we are able to work with the government to support and incubate some of the beneficiaries that they have. Through a partnership with uh, the UNFPA, we are able to work with the Ministry of Health and deploy uh, health solutions and pilot health solutions in districts with their blessings. So in terms of, we've, we've, for now we've not been using the normal procurement process. Uh, but we've used the use case of the innovation mandate uh, that the ICT ministry was able to get a waiver on in terms of how solutions uh, are deployed and actually rolled out. So one of the encouragements largely for someone starting out who has a very good use case is the reason such places exist is to lobby and advocate on your behalf. And now that we have an association, we noticed that it's not enough for just an outbox to lobby, but the collective of like-minded organizations to actually lobby. And I would say that one way of going about that is to approach organizations like ours so that we can utilize the relationships we have, uh, for instance, with the ICT ministry in terms of how we can lobby and get you to pilot or deploy your solutions. So that's one way that you can actually uh, think about it. Thank you, Richard. We are drawing to the close and I'll be going around to ask for final views. But just before that, Richard, um, India right now is raking in a whole load of Forex doing work for Silicon Valley and the rest of the world. How do we become the next uh, to Silicon Valley and to the likes of Silicon Valley? It's, it's a very interesting question because um, already we have seen some organizations demonstrate that we have that potential. The likes of Andela, for instance, the business model is built on, you know, building local software developers to provide businesses for American companies. We have another startup called Tunga that just does, that just does that exactly for European businesses. And recently the Japanese approached us for something similar to that. But what we've learned out of that is the high cost of scaling because we have a very huge talent gap that exists in the local ecosystem. And, and it's my belief, and that's why we have a digital academy. It's my belief that if we took very small steps, but having that future thinking, that if within three or four years, we are able to take a deliberate effort to upskill our young people to provide those services, then we shall definitely reap from that. I can assure you for you to provide such a service, you need a minimum of four years of experience from the research we've done. And you need to demonstrate certain qualities. But until we take that long-term thinking, we won't get there. So we have to start the investment now 
but in five years, it's like you planting trees on a piece of land. In five years, surely the benefits will pay off. Thank you so much, Richard. And now to get uh, to quick comments from our panelists, we do appreciate uh, Tusu in absentia, uh, Dr. Julian, uh, Suzanne or Tim, uh, Richard Zulu, and uh, Noah Balesanvu for joining us as panelists and responding to the paper that Castle has presented. Um, and I'm going to request each one of you to make last comments in about 30 seconds each, beginning with you, Richard, since you're the one that's facing us right now. Yeah, um, I think my, my comment largely goes to one of the Q&A um, submissions that was made around how it's important for us to uh, move from theory to action. But also I saw another question around an individual that says, I run a, a private institute. And in this private institute, we can do remote learning, but we cannot. And it's, it's you know, very costly. And for me, what I really want to point to in, in, in summary is what I call systems thinking. When we set out to do this work around supporting innovation and entrepreneurship, I've been doing this for the last 10 years. But at the seventh year, we came to realize that, you know what? You cannot walk this journey alone, largely if you want to change a system. There are very many players in a system, right? Uh, for instance, in our area, we have researchers, uh, we have the innovation hubs, we have policy and very many others. The same thing applies to that gentleman in education. One thing you have to learn is the purpose of inclusivity. And if as long as for you have the capabilities, but you're not coordinated in your response to say, what about those universities that cannot deliver this? What do we do about it? So we need to move from thinking just about my role to having discussions with different stakeholders, because as long as the silos are not broken in terms of how we utilize ICT and opportunities, we won't yes. make movement. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, breaking the silos, that being the last thoughts and systems thinking. Dr. Julian, your 30 seconds. Thank you once again, Paul. Um, uh, yes, so RAIN is, is something that was, has been alluded to previously, of course. Uh, PPP, public-private partnerships, um, are very important. Most of the things that we are talking about um, are being handled to a certain extent by some of the institutions. And uh, thanks to CASO for organizing this to you know, generate the dialogue. And I think more and more is needed. The minister said they are ready to receive all the submissions. Uh, and that also speaks to PPP. But um, I think we also need transparent ways by which we can interact uh, because it may not be very obvious how someone actually gets their thoughts in to to the ministry or to the regulators. So having a framework, having a platform by which we can have this kind of engagement and continue sharing thoughts is very important. Thank you very much once again. Thank you so much, Dr. Julian. It's been great having you today. Noah, any last thoughts? Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share thoughts and to engage in this. Uh, my prayer is that we'll continue um, you know, escalating these thoughts to the highest points of leadership so that uh, we, we can facilitate for a better Uganda uh, through embracing these new opportunities that are created. My parting thoughts is just uh, hinged on something that Dr. Tuso mentioned, that change is normal. Um, you'll find that everyone that resisted change was relegated to oblivion. Many of us remember Kodak, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to guess the average age of the attendees. Um, Kodak doesn't exist anymore because we don't need a uh, film in cameras. We have a camera in your pocket right now. Uh, so resisting change can, from a business uh, per hour cycle is, is futile. And what I want to challenge us is to get into digital thinking. Digital thinking is different from uh, automation or, or, or what we think as, as embracing ICT. Let me give you this example. When the, uh, when, when the, the pandemic hit and the restaurants were reopened, 
there are people in trying in trying to keep surfaces clean and hygienic and reduce uh, contact. Some restaurants uh, printed out their menu and put it under the glass table, which they sanitized every you know every ten minutes. Another restaurant put a QR code on the corner there where you scan with your phone and get the menu on your phone. One is thinking normal, the other one is thinking digital. So even the way we think must change. We don't, we're not just saying remove paper, although it is good, remove paper from, from ministries, that is fine. But then even just making emails, uh, you know, sending emails back and forth might not be the best use of digital technology. So uh, my challenge is for us to start thinking digitally. What does it mean to think digitally? To understand how can you deliver your value to your customer, to your user in the most efficient and productive way. And so that digital transformation thinking is what we do uh, in the organization that I serve on a day-to-day -day basis. But rather, and, and, and more importantly, it is what I encourage us and for us like Castle to keep thinking uh, and, and it, 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 it continues, continuously question the way we think, not what we think, the way we think about our problems is what is going to enable us to create those new opportunities of the future while harnessing the, 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 the brilliant talent that we have today, as has been said by the previous speakers. And with that, I thank you so much for the opportunity and I remain always available to help in, uh, in these conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Noah, on the note of uh, questioning the way we think. Um, thank you so much. Um, and lastly, the presenter from CASO, Mr. Robert Muchiaba, your parting comments in a minute, please. Mr. Muchiaba. Uh, my parting points, I would like, number one, to appreciate all the discussants for the issues that you have raised with the guidance, apostate, that have put the experiences that Clearly, as Castle, we do have some. Uh, Mr. Mbaba, we lost you. Kindly readjust your microphone. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, that is clear. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I was thanking the discussants uh, for all the very, very pertinent issues that you have raised, the guiding discussions, the experiences you have shared, and uh, saying that clearly, as CASO, we have uh, this cutout, but also uh, broadly as a country, uh, that we have got to do the heavy lifting and see ways that we are going to progress to where we want to be. I was reading a paper the other day, and if time had allowed, I'd wanted to start with the story of India. How India has moved from the around 1960s, has moved from being having no revenue at all from ICT. Right now, where India is, is, is bugging about 160, I mean 126, 126 billion dollars a year out of ICT exports. And they are able to find uh, international delegates from all of, over, over the world to go and visit India in the event they organize, which is a strategic event called India Soft. They pay your ticket, they pay your hotel, and they meet every course just so they can expand and strategically create the market for their homegrown solutions to go out of the world. When I was reading this the Genesis, I realized that this all started from very, very far away. So uh, it's a heavy lifting we have to do. We have to continue thinking strategically. I believe that change is on the way. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Mr. Mutiaba, and uh, my name is Bukenya Paul Michael. I am happy to have moderated this session. And um, in the words of Dr. Engineer Dr. Tusu, benefit and utility is going to be the way we have to think. Kindly allow me to invite Dr. James Magara to make the closing comments to this call. It's been my pleasure to moderate and host this particular webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, thank you to all our panelists. Panelists, uh, Special thanks to our special guests who uh, had to leave early and uh, also to Tusu who had to leave early. Um, thank you for engaging and uh, really speaking out, uh, even speaking out of the box and challenging the thinking. Uh, it's very evident that our world has moved on. And as uh, Noah said, uh, when you resist change, you're relegated to the rubbish of history. 
And uh, so there are things we'll move away with here. Um, education is not going to be the same. Business is not going to be the same. Almost every aspect of our lives is not going to be the same. And uh, we can spend a lot of time wishing and waiting for the new, norm, for the old to come back. But I think it's time we realize that some things will not go back to where they were and uh, move on. So we will, as an organization, work on the many, many new ideas that have come up uh, that have been additional to the think piece. And they will, they have been, they have been captured. Uh, they will be uh, included in the final document. And for those who may have missed, uh, you please let them know these uh, webinars are on Facebook. Uh, you can go back and see all the previous ones. They are still there. And even this one will be there. So if anyone would be, like to see what's happening, uh, please uh, let them go to our Facebook page. Next week, we continue the discussion. We are looking at employment next week. Employment has changed drastically. Uh, but there are also challenges we have, unique challenges we have uh, in our own part of the world uh, because of our unique situation, the fast growing population. So the conversation next week is around employment. I uh, plan to be there every Saturday morning for quite a while. We'll be doing this, looking at different sectors. Once again, thank you very much and uh, have a very good afternoon, all participants and panelists. Thank you. <laughs>